Welcome to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from July 4th, 2001. From the high desert in the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening and or good morning wherever you may be across this great land of ours. From Guam, out across the date line, all the way east to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, where I'm going to go visit one day, south into South America, north all the way to the pole, this is Coast to Coast AM, worldwide, of course, on the Internet. In Roswell, New Mexico, where it's all been happening, coming up shortly, Linda Moulton Howe, Colonel Philip J. Corso retired, and William J. Burns, who co-authored The Day After Roswell with Colonel Corso. As promised, coming up shortly... of published books about Roswell and about extraterrestrials, I would venture a guess that none has stirred the pot more heavily than the book we're going to talk about tonight and the man who wrote it, actually men who wrote it. Uh, Colonel Philip J. Carso, retired uh, along with uh, William J. Burns, has authored The Day After Roswell. And in fact, it is The Day After Roswell when things really began to happen. Here in Roswell, to begin it all, is Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, welcome. All right, hi. You know, it was April 9, 1983, that I was sitting in that office at Kirtland Air Force Base with Air Force Office of Special Investigations Agent Richard C. Doty, who was handing me a paper that he said that I could read and I could not take notes and he made me sit in a chair in the middle of a room that I later learned was because they videotaped and audiotaped my reactions to what I was reading. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, and the top of that briefing paper said, in all caps, centered, briefing paper for the President of the United States of America on the subject of identified aerial vehicles in apparent IACS. And when I turned to the next page in the first paragraph of about eight or nine sentences, it it listed retrievals of extraterrestrial, and that was the word that was used in that paper that I saw April 9, 1983, of extraterrestrial craft and bodies, both dead and alive, from a series of locations in the southwestern United States and the northern nation of Mexico. And it listed a series of cities and areas, including at least two in the Roswell area in 47 and 49, one as early as 1946, predating all of the historic discussion about 1947, huh. talked about the retrieval of a craft from northern Mexico south of Laredo, Texas, over the border, talked about the uh, retrieval of a crash in uh, Kingman, Arizona, and Magdalena, which is out in the near the plains of St. Augustine, and all of that was listed. And the paper went into a historic insight and evolution of how that our government, uh, in, in terms of confronting having these craft and these beings that they didn't understand what they were or where they came from, had set in motion a series of insider military, medical, and scientific people to study but to keep all of this information from the public and the media while they ascertained whether there was a national security threat. Mm. One of the conversations with Richard Doty that day, April 9, 1983, he mentioned that inside of our United States government that one of the things that had also helped keep this uh, whole story covered up for nearly half a century was internal conflict between the intelligence agencies in the United States and military branches, that in, inside of the structures of our government, we had a kind of internecine war going on between various bureaus. 
Well, that's not hard to imagine because the military wars between the various branches of its own. That's right. And in 1947, for the very first time, the United States separated Army Air Force into two separate branches, which added to the confusion in 1947. Well, tonight, I am sitting with a book on my lap. The top says, The truth exposed after 50 years, a former Pentagon official reveals the United States government's shocking UFO cover-up the day after Roswell by Colonel Philip J. Corso, retired with William J. Burns, forward by Senator Strom Thurmond. I have read this book from cover to cover, and I have found material that absolutely addresses some of the questions that I've had ever since this description of internal battles within our own intelligence forces and military, and also another area which tonight I hope that we will be able to talk about at least three areas. One is what Philip Corso knew about our government's knowledge of a non-human intelligence and technology and what his assignment was concerning that alien technology, his own extraordinary experiences inside of this internecine warfare that was going on in which he knew and took the position that the Army had to keep at all costs any of this alien technology and any related sensitive areas away from the Central Intelligence Agency because at that point, coming out of World War II, the Army, the then new Air Force, and the Navy were more concerned about possible KGB spies inside of the Central Intelligence Agency than anything else, and they were afraid that if the material that they collected went into that agency, that was controlling intelligence, that they would lose it forever from the American industrial military complex having any hands-on. It would be like going into a black hole. And then there is a third area that has been brought up to me over the last 15 years periodically that I have not myself understood. And it has been men who have asked me in my investigations of things like the animal mutilation mystery and others, did I have knowledge about Earth's secret war in relationship to the non-human intelligence and the position that our government had taken in relationship to it. Until the last two or three days, and a, a real privilege to sit down and talk in some detail with Colonel Corso and with William Burns, I have had a lot of the a lot of confusion that I think everyone else does about exactly what has been happening over the last 50 years that has kept this policy of silence and the suggestions that inside our own government there has been tremendous conflict. And what is this Earth secret war about? Tonight, I think if we start and move through these three large areas, that the whole non-human intelligence area may be part of the heart of an internecine warfare, but that this story is so big and so huge, and I'm sitting with two men that have facets about this that are, have answered some questions for me, and I hope by the end of these three hours, Art, that uh, you and the audience will also realize that this book is one of the most important voices that has emerged in the last 50 years from a man who was there in 1960 to 63 in the Pentagon working with Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau on one of the most provocative challenges that I have ever read anywhere in my life, and that was how to get not understood artifacts retrieved from these disks into the industrial complex of the United States so that it could be hopefully used by military and industry without being swallowed up into the black hole of intelligence that would never let it out. And now I'm going to introduce Colonel Philip J. Corso, retired, the man with a remarkable first-hand experience with this information, and we are working in a Roswell uh, Inn where we have been, where we uh, have one phone, uh, that we have a, a sort of a, a difficult phone system here, and what I'm going to do is pose a question to Colonel Corso, and then I'm going to try to help moderate around with this phone so that 
uh, William Burns will be able to make his comment when he wants and questions and art and so you'll understand we have a phone that the three of us are going to share uh, over some of the most important uh, information that I've ever encountered and I'm going to start with an area that I think that probably listeners would like to know something about first and then evolve into these much larger amazing issues and that is to have Colonel Corso talk to us about his first-hand experience at Fort Riley, Kansas, back in 1947 when he himself saw a not, at what is called an extraterrestrial biological entity. This is Colonel Corso. Hello. Colonel, welcome to the program. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, Colonel, um, you saw an extraterrestrial at Fort Riley, Kansas. Yes. I want to explain to you uh, how that happened. Uh, I came back from Italy, and I was in the Pentagon, and I asked for assignment, and they gave me an assignment for Fort Riley. It was garrison duty, and I'd never had garrison duty, and I enjoyed it very much later. But one particular night, I was the post-duty officer. Now, a lot of people seem confused on what that means, not being in the military. That particular night, I was in charge of almost all security, the guards, so forth, and all the buildings in the post all night long till morning. Sure. I wore a sidearm and I wore a band on my arm identifying me as a post-duty officer. What rank were you then? I was a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel. And one of my primary duties was to inspect the guard to make sure they were all on duty in the right places and doing their job, not sleeping at 3 o'clock in the morning. For them. In fact, one of my duties on a, on a lighter note, so I, I, they gave me, I had an instruction book where I made the notes and my report that I gave to the general the next morning. And one of the lighter notes was, somebody had written in there, and make sure at 1 o'clock in the morning you close the officer club up and throw all the drunks out. <laughs> <laughs> that was written in by hand by somebody. So as post-duty officer, I knew, I was told, there was a sensitive area in one of the veterinarian areas. Now, we had horses in, too. And uh, so uh, about 3 in the morning, 2 or 3 in the morning, it was... I went down, I was doing my rounds of the guards, and I stopped in this particular guard, and the master sergeant that I knew very well, I used to bowl with him at the field house, was the, the, the sergeant of the guard. And I told him, Sergeant, how you doing here? Is everything quiet? And he said, yes, sir. And he said, I told me it was pretty sensitive area tonight, so I want you to stay alert and your boys alert. He said, you want to see something, Colonel? I said, yes. So I walked in the back room with him, and I lifted the end of the tarp up, and here was this body floating in some sort of liquid. And it was a strange thing. It was a small body. I thought it was a child first. Then I looked at the head and so forth and the arms, and I saw it wasn't a child. It was a great color. And then I put the top back down. Now, all this lasted, I'd say, 15 seconds or so. 15 seconds. Yes. Uh, long enough to recall details? Or? I, was a, I was an intelligence officer, and I was known to have... a. a good retention on what I saw. What did you see in the face? So the face was, uh, the head was large, but not as large as most uh, drawings show. It was in largest proportion of a small body. Uh-huh. No ears, no nose, no mouth, slits only. And the eyes were a little large, slanted, large compared to our eyes, but not great uh, large eyes. The arms were sort of spindly and the legs were sort of spindly. How, how big would you say this creature was? Well, it wasn't even five feet tall. In fact, I thought it was a small child when I first saw it. Okay. And it sort of turned my stomach a little bit. But this was a normal reaction even in combat areas when I saw people mowed down by artillery firing. I get the same feeling. And usually you recover fast because you almost have to when you're in sure. command of troops. Sure. And I recovered fast. And I figured, well, I don't know what it is. I can't evaluate it. So like a good intelligence officer, and I was trained by the British, by the way, I put it in the back of my head, and I figured someday, someplace, maybe I'll get cooperation and be able to evaluate this for what it is. And that, from then on, I forgot about it until something came out to bring it back. Let me ask you one so, other question, uh, Colonel. Uh, surely you and the sergeant must have had a conversation. I told the sergeant this. I told him, sergeant, get out of here, get out of this room. You could get in a lot of trouble. I'm the post-duty officer. I have all the clearance. Of course, it's my duty to look around like this. 
but you're not supposed to be in here, so get out in the early, Sarge, in front of me. Okay. And that was a, a, and then I asked him this question, now, a very important question. As we were walking out, I told him, Sergeant, uh, where did it come from? He said, well, we talk, I talked to the drivers. There was two men in each car, two soldiers in each truck. There were five trucks total. And he said that he said, it came from some airfield in Fort Riley, they said, and they're hidden from Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And that was all it was said. It, it came didn't describe Roswell or the base here. It said an, an, an Air Force, an, an Army Air Force base in New Mexico. And that was all he, t- he told me. Okay. This was 1947. 1947. 47, all right. It was, uh, I'd say, a week or about two weeks after it happened here. And not long after, I was assigned that about a month before it in Fort Riley. And this was in a veterinary office. Well, we had veterinaries, and that was a logical place to, place to keep some of this. Sure. Sure. Um, and so you just, after that experience, you just sort of filed it away for future reference. Yes, sir. Because the intelligence, uh, the intelligence process says collect, evaluate, cooperate, and, and then come forward with your report. Yes. That's exactly what I did. I didn't know what it was. So I put it in the back of my head. And here's Linda back. All right. Art? Yes. I just want to help because the timelines here we need to stay on top of. That was 1947. Right. And I'm just going to, for just a moment, give some background that Colonel Philip Corso was a key Army intelligence officer who served on General MacArthur's staff in Korea and later on President Dwight D. Eisenhower's National Security Council as a lieutenant colonel. Uh-huh. During his 21-year military career, he was honored with 19 medals, decorations, and ribbons for meritorious service. He retired from the Army in 1963 after three extraordinary years from 1960 to 1963, working directly with Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau in the Pentagon concerning this whole issue now from 47 to 1960 Colonel Corso had had that one experience of seeing this extraterrestrial biological entity at Fort Riley on its way to Wright Patterson now let's jump to 1960 and for a moment what I'd like to do is turn the phone Linda we're, we're right at the bottom of the hour okay. so it's and a, after we come back I want William Burns to set the stage here right. for one of the most extraordinarily important points in United States history one other thing that I want to touch on uh, put it on your list of things to ask an obvious question Linda is uh, after all those years why is Colonel Corso coming forward now and is his retirement threatened by doing so? I mean, an obvious question, uh, and what kind of struggle he went through before he decided to uh, uh, to write such a book and right. come and forward. It's, it's, yes, and it's exactly what I was leading to for uh, Mr. Burns to explain how this could come about now at uh, Colonel Corso not being in jeopardy. Excellent. We will um, pick up on that point um, with William J. Burns when we return. I'm Art Bell. My guests are Linda Moulton Howe, Colonel Philip J. Corso retired, and William J. Burns. And we'll all be right back. This is Premier Networks. That was Art Bell hosting Coast to Coast AM on this Somewhere in Time. To Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. Back now to Roswell, New Mexico. Linda? Hi, Art. Hi. In the mid-80s, when I first heard that phrase, Earth's Secret War, and what in the world was it about, I always thought that it was simply something of an inside unit in our government versus whatever the non-human intelligence was. What I'm beginning to understand in my conversations with Colonel Corso and William Burns is that it was a very much more complex and dicey situation in which the military was perceiving that they were having to operate as if not only did they not understand a non-human intelligence, 
that uh, Colonel Corso described in his own book, they knew that there were animal mutilations and human abductions in the late 1950s, early 1950s, or uh, late 1940s, somewhere in that period, that they felt that they had to be concerned about, but they were also concerned about their Cold War enemies and this intense um, suspicion of spies in the Central Intelligence Agency and other agencies. And this sets the stage for the period of 1960 to 63. And I'm going to read briefly from the book. In 1961, Colonel Corso, then a lieutenant colonel, was given command of one of the Pentagon's highly classified weapons development budgets and was made privy to the United States government's greatest secret, colon, the dismantling and appropriation of the Roswell extraterrestrial spacecraft by the United States Army. Identifying all those involved, Colonel Corso reveals how a deep cover council officially discounted all UFO reports to the American public and cleared the path for his research and development team at the Pentagon to analyze and integrate the Roswell artifacts into the military arsenal and the private business sector. The extent of the operation is startling. With unprecedented detail, Colonel Corso divulges how he spearheaded the Army's reverse engineering project that seeded, and that's S-E-E-D-E-D, -E -E like you would plant seeds, seeded alien technology at American companies such as IBM, Hughes Aircraft, Bell Labs, and Dow Corning without their knowledge. He describes the devices found aboard the Roswell craft and how they were the precursors for today's integrated circuit chips, fiber optics, lasers, and super tenacity fibers. He also discusses the role alien technology played in shaping geopolitical policy and events, how it helped the United States surpass the Russians in space, spurred elaborate army initiatives such as SDI, which is the Star Wars program, Project Horizon, which we will talk about later in the program, but had to do with putting a base on the moon. Project HARP, that we have done shows on in the past, and ultimately brought about the end of the Cold War, unquote. I'm quoting from the day after Roswell. Right. And now I am going to go to William J. Burns, the writer with Colonel Corso, to explain what was happening at the time that John F. Kennedy was president of the United States for a period of time before he was assassinated. And during those three crucial years, this is William Burns' analysis of this internecine warfare in the world picture. All right. Hi, Art. How are you? Uh, Mr. Burns, well, yes. welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Um, uh, may I go back a little bit before we get going here and sure. ask you um, how in the world uh, Colonel Corso can now come forward, uh, or at any time can come forward, and be safe. First of all, Colonel Corso's relationships with um, the United States government intelligence community within the military are rock solid. He was an advisor to members of the Senate, an uh -huh. advisor to presidents, and an advisor to generals at the highest level of the military, and not just the Army, but obviously generals from other services as well shared in the intelligence that Colonel Corso helped develop during the course of his career. So the very people that would be the ones who would look with great disfavor upon what Colonel Corso was doing were the ones who during his tenure in office, and not just at the Pentagon, but at the Eisenhower White House, when he was a military commander in the most sensitive area of Europe, the Southern German Command, where he had authority to use field nuclear weapons, those very officers, were the, those very intelligence officers, were the ones that he'd been putting in their places for 20 years. So no, they're not going to come forward now. This is a war that he's already showed who owns the battlefield on that one. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me his reasoning for coming forward? He must have struggled greatly with this before going public. Yes and no. Um, and when the time comes, I think the colonel himself is probably a, a more appropriate person to describe this, but I will tell you what he told me, and then a little later on we can hear it from the colonel in his own words. Basically, 
the colonel belonged to a handful of officers led by, from the memoirs that I read of, of the man himself, written by the man himself, and the colonel's own memoirs, Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau, who was probably one of the last of the great combat officers who had a grounding in military technology. I think it's a breed we don't have anymore. I don't want to speak for the present leadership, but I'm just saying that when you look at things like the War of the Generals and all the generals bumping heads in the Persian Gulf, and then you see a man like Arthur Trudeau, who during the Korean War, his men were trapped on Pork Chop Hill, and the orders came to abandon the men. Arthur Trudeau said, hell no, took off his general's helmet, put on a sergeant's helmet, and said, who's coming up with me? ran up the hill, took the man, brought him back down, put on his general's helmet, and that was it. Now, that's a hero. Okay? You betcha. You betcha. This is a man who fought um, the CIA, who was blasted by people like Dulles, and who came out on top every single time, and who led Army intelligence, and who completely reorganized the uh, Army R&D inside the Pentagon, completely reorganized it to make what this book is about possible. So... This man and the colonel were friends well after both men retired. Uh, uh, General Trudeau went on to be um, a consultant to industry, had his own industrial consulting firm, worked, I think, for Gulf Oil in Pennsylvania. He was um, a good friend of the colonel's for many, many years afterwards. The two men had an oath. The oath was very simple. We will maintain our silence while we're both alive. And when the general was sick, called the colonel aside, the two men, two old soldiers, you have to imagine the scene, I can. and said, I'm going to release you from your oath of silence. You can tell this story. And that was what it is. Uh, there was no national security oath, no great overriding concern of national security. This is what two men did inside the army. So this wasn't as though this was a great military strategy or a great defense strategy. This operated within the army with a handful of officers. Nobody else knew about it. That was the point. So there was there was no national security to breach. Now, uh, to get to Linda's point of this, uh, uh, this war, um, I can fully understand that uh, the military would not necessarily want the CIA or other intelligence agencies getting hold of this information because over the years we've seen I don't know how many spies uh, caught, uh, moles that have been passing information, were passing information, went to jail for it, to the uh, then Soviet Union. So there's no question about that. I, I can understand why they would want to keep it out of the hands of the military. Is that accurate, or, or of, of the intelligence community? That's accurate, Art. It is the very, very tip of the iceberg. It is only a micro sliver, a, a membrane sliver of what the real story is, which is much more frightening, much more horrifying, and when you realize how close this country came to nuclear war on a number of occasions because of bad intelligence, mistakes, and false assumptions, you realize how close to the edge we came. The real story starts even before the end of World War II with the OSS running around Europe and with the penetration of the OSS even at that time. And this is not from Colonel Corso's own words. These are from words of CIA people themselves by NKVD units and Russian playbacks into our own intelligence services. Uh -huh. This was not the military intelligence. This was the civilian intelligence services, and I want to draw that distinction very early in. Right. Military intelligence, Army G2, was separate and distinct from the civilian intelligence services, such as the OSS. Understood. Okay, now, so we knew, the Army knew, that even at the end of World War II, that the Germans had fallen into possession of some kind of extraterrestrial technology. The burst of strange German technology toward the end of the war was frightening. We knew that. We knew that from the scientists that we had retrieved 
from Germany. Colonel Corso happened to be one of the military officers who helped run Operation Paperclip when he was the area commander of Rome in, from 1944 to 1947, fighting off the rear guard Nazi Gestapo SS units and the Russian NKVD units posing as communist partisans. What were they after? It certainly wasn't Rome, though it was Mussolini's gold. What it was were whatever German secrets were available in Italy and Switzerland and the whole area at that time. And remember, there was another person coming into the scene working for the OSS at that time, Mo Berg who also went through looking for whatever atomic secrets he could. Again, all documented, no big military secrets here. The secret is that Phil Corso was one of the people involved in the military end of paperclip. The German scientists told the army, told Corso, told Trudeau, told other people in the military, that the Germans had been in possession of extraterrestrial secrets. So the military intelligence end, as well as the OSS, as well as the Russians, as well as the British, knew that the Germans had stumbled upon a stockpile of some phenomenal technology. This is setting the stage for what happened in before, 19, well, before the Roswell crash in 1947 with, this, with the split between the military and the civilian intelligence services um, when the National Security Act was passed uh, under Truman, creating, in effect, the first fully functional full-time civilian intelligence service which operated under a black budget under the National Security Act separate and distinct from direct and explicit congressional oversight. The Army, the Navy, eventually the Air Force, had intelligence services that were operated under congressional oversight and military oversight. They right. operated in plain view, but this new service was totally secret. It was a secret government. What the Truman administration did not know was that prior to this creation of the superintelligence agency, its own command structure had been infiltrated by communist sympathizers. And I'm not saying this like some right-wing fanatic from the 1950s. I'm saying this as a matter of history, because the CIA officers themselves said this, had been infiltrated by communist sympathizers and, it's, and in many instances, NKVD moles themselves. We created an intelligence service separate from congressional oversight, almost immune, operating with impunity that had already been compromised, and nobody knew it except the military. Mr. Burns, was there an operational name for this organization? Well, originally, the organization was the Central Intelligence Group, the CIG, run by Admiral Roscoe Hillencutter. Remember his name, because where does Hillencutter turn up after the Roswell crash? It was the Central Intelligence Group, which eventually became, eventually, the CIA. Which became, now, okay. as Colonel Corso was serving his time as a range officer, commanding a missile battalion in White Sands, then going to the most sensitive area of Germany, then serving as Inspector General, toward the end of the Eisenhower administration, there was a restructuring going on. General Trudeau, had reorganized the entire Army R&D after he left G2, and this began in 1959. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Linda correctly suggests that, that um, G2 is Army Intelligence, and Lieutenant General Trudeau was the commander of intelligence. He reorganized R&D, remember, he was an engineer. And so he reorganized Army R&D when he took over in 1959. Um, the colonel who's a scholar on Army R&D, on the history of this, will tell you that originally Army R&D had a minor function under logistics. Mm -hmm. Even General Twining himself, again, a name we remember from the Roswell crash, had suggested that the, that the study of UFOs, and this is his words, not mine, the study of flying saucers, the analysis of what it is, be given to foreign technology under R&D. This is what Twining himself said all the way back in the late, in, in after 1947 and in the early 50s. But on the R&D, military R&D wasn't up to snuff. Not until General Trudeau reorganized it in 69. He had requested when 59, 
Colonel Grosso, correct me. When um, the colonel came back to the United States after his tour of duty in Germany, General Trudeau requested that in 1961 he report to the Pentagon. This is shortly after the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. He report to the Pentagon to take over. The situation was, however, that by the time the colonel arrived at the Pentagon, it had become even more urgent. The army was sitting on material that had been basically housed in the Pentagon in um, some way, shape, or form for 14 years. Mr. Burns, uh, there's a couple of things I'm unclear about. Go ahead. Uh, one is an astounding revelation that the Germans had, uh, you're, you're suggesting the Germans had alien technology before we did. What I'm suggesting is that the Germans themselves told us that they had alien technology before the end of World War II, yes. And that would, right. that, would have been prior, that would have been prior to our acquisition of any of that. That's correct. Herman yeah. Oberth, who was on Colonel Corso's, basically his ad hoc brain trust inside R&D, told the Colonel directly that the Germans had that technology. Do we know how they acquired it? All right, I just want to intrude, put one thing in here. It was Herman Oberth who was referenced in the very important Kehoe books as having knowledge of researching where the source of this non-human intelligence might be. It was Herman Oberth who was talking to Kehoe right from that whole period of time that uh, Kehoe uh, wrote about, and if everybody would go back and read Kehoe books, they would begin to see that the pattern of what uh, Colonel Corso and William Burns are describing right now is laid out in another direction. All right, Linda, now. but my question is this. Uh, maybe we can get a simple answer. Um, we're uh, it is suggested or said that the Germans had alien technology before right. we did, and my question is simply, can anybody describe to me how the Germans acquired that, or do we simply know they have it and we don't know how they got it? Uh, I'll tell you just one brief thing, and then I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Burns again, that uh, I was told by uh, people during that 83-84 time period when I was working on that HBO project and it ha after that meeting with Jody at Kirtland that the story went back to 1937. Uh, that the Germans had retrieved either a craft or portions of a craft with technology that our government was extremely concerned about, but proving exactly what was retrieved by the Germans and uh, under what conditions, I do not know the details, and I'm going to turn it back uh, to uh, Mr. Burns to make a comment, and then uh, we'll go to the uh, Colonel. All right. So imagine the stage being set. The Army knows the Germans have utilized alien technology. The Army retrieved alien technology from the crash at Roswell in 1947. Nothing, nothing at all was done with it. Maybe there were some furtive attempts uh, from the original um, storehouse at the uh, right field to try to farm it into industry to analyze this, but nothing formal, no plan, no strategy. Something else was happening in the late 1950s as well and the early 1960s during this period. It was that the FBI had been receiving strange reports of abductions. Now, when you look at this logically from a law enforcement perspective, where would reports of abductions normally go? I mean, you certainly wouldn't go running around uh, up to too many psychiatrists. People would think you're crazy. Yes. But people who reported being taken from their homes called the police. Well, that's a federal crime. So the police would turn it over to the FBI. So the FBI, and this spooked the hell out of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI begins compiling reports in an organized way on abductions. They're not saying alien abductions. They're not saying UFOs. They're not saying flying In other words, at this point, the FBI doesn't know what the hell's going on. They're, in, they're, they're investigating. Nobody knows what's going on. That's the whole point. All right. This is a complete crowd of unknowing. All right. Uh, Ms. Burns, we're at the top of the hour. Everybody gets to rest for a while. We'll recoup and start again uh, after the news. Stay right there. Oof. A lot of... Wow. <laughs> Colonel Philip J. Corso retired. William J. Burns and Linda Howe are my guests from Roswell. The trip back in time continues with Art Bell hosting Coast to Coast AM. More Somewhere in Time coming up.
Networks presents Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the, the best talk radio in the nighttime. No brag, just fact. We're the best. And it's, uh, it's because all of, of all of you, and uh, I want you to know I appreciate it. to Roswell, New Mexico, and I'm not sure who's on the line. Hello there. Hi, it's Linda. Hi, Linda. Okay, good. All right, before we go to Colonel Corso to describe exactly what these physical artifacts were in these file cabinets in General Trudeau's offices that uh, Colonel Corso was then given the assignment by the general to try to get into the military-industrial complex research and development projects, I would like William Burns to just go into the details of the relationship a little bit more between the Federal Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, and the Central Intelligence Agency when John F. Kennedy became president in 1960, and a few months later is when Philip Forso was in the Pentagon talking with General Trudeau about what they had to do in one of the most incredible situations of this internecine warfare within our own government, and here is uh, William Burns to help explain this. So the stage is set now that it's 1960, and you've got this split between the civilian intelligence services, basically the CIA, which had been penetrated by the KGB and was really pumping out through false estimates of intelligence. Right a Communist Party line, a Soviet line. You have the military, which knows about this, and you have some senators and government people in the know and some not in the know. At this point, you've got reports of these strange abductions reaching the FBI. Hoover absolutely does not trust the CIA, and in fact, what you may know, many of the listeners may know, that as early as the late 1940s, there was a shooting war going on between the CIA and the FBI over spying and over the running of drugs um, right after the end of the war. So there was no love loss between these agencies. At the same time, at the very same time, these strange reports of cattle and animal mutilations began reaching the local sheriff's departments, because they're not doing these things in the middle of New York City. Sure. Where are they? They're out in the West. They're on farmland. They're on cattle ranches. You bet. Sheriffs get these reports. What do they do? They begin compiling them, turning them over to the state departments of public safety in places like Texas, Colorado, Wyoming. Eventually, they reach the FBI. What is the FBI supposed to do? Well, when they go to the CIA for help, it's like throwing something into a bottomless pit. Nothing comes out, and the agents aren't, agencies aren't talking to each other anyway. Right. But the Army begins compiling these reports because where else can the FBI go? It is now the spring of 19... It is now just after January in 1961. There is a full-scale war going on inside the Beltway between the civilian intelligence, i.e. the CIA, and the military intelligence. The three military services, Army, Navy, Air Force, all have their own separate R&D divisions. Trudeau effectively organizes the Army into the most powerful R&D division that exists, and this... In the midst of this warfare is where Colonel Corso comes to begin his stint as the director of foreign technology, the very same division named by Nathan Twining a decade earlier to be the repository of the alien artifacts. JFK and RFK have just taken office, a completely new administration. They are not well liked by the intelligence community. They are not well liked because they are obviously very fraternal. And remember, they come to power. This administration comes to power under a cloud of suspicion to begin with because of the whole Cook County vote and what happened in the final hours of the electoral count to get them into office in the first place. Lyndon Johnson, as you know, also made many, many political deals to gain favor in the Senate and to reach power, and the Johnson family became very, very powerful in Texas, strong ties to the FBI. So this is an administration which comes in under a real cloud of suspicion. All right. 
Okay. All right. Uh, and, and so that sets the stage. And now, from Colonel Corso, I presume, we should ask what he found in these uh, uh, General Trudeau's cabinets. Okay. Well, before we even get to that, remember the first thing that RFK and that JFK and RFK are faced with when they reach office is they are dealing with the information coming to support the Bay of Pigs. Right. So they immediately run afoul of the CIA in the very early days of the administration because they pull back from the Bay of Pigs, infuriate the um, emigrate Cuban community in the United States, but also infuriate the whole civilian intelligence apparatus. I'm sure. And when he removed Alan Dulles, from the CIA, a long time political hand, he um, in uh, in in government, he also further angers the CIA, and the war is now exacerbated, and that's what happens. As Colonel Corso. Well, the only the only wor word I would think of would be betrayal. They would feel betrayed. That's right, and they're betrayed, and at the center of this whole warfare is the stockpile of information and technology retrieved from Roswell sitting in the Pentagon. All right. And here Art is Colonel Corso to describe what he physically saw handled in these file drawers in General Trudeau's office. All right. Colonel Corso. Yeah, I'm on now. Welcome back. All right. Uh, they have set the stage well, and so there you are uh, working for General Trudeau. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, what did you find, and how did your own words, sir? Yeah. Well, just let me go back a little, a little bit. When uh, General Trudeau said he was going to send for him, he told me this. He came over to visit Germany, and when I came back, he sent for me. And the chief of personnel called me. And I went into General Trudeau, and I said, "He said you on board, Phil?" And yes. He said, "Watch things for me, Phil. The rest don't understand." And it was what. Bill Burns has just described to you what he meant, really. So he made me a special assistant. Then about, oh, I'd say a week or ten days passed, and I was appointed on the Foreign Technology Division. When I moved in the Foreign Technology Division, just a, shortly after that, General Trudeau called me and said, I'm delivering a, fa a file cabinet to you. He said, You're go you go through it. And you start working up a plan of action and recommendations to me. Without telling you what was in it? No, no. He didn't tell me what was in it. Oh, boy. And oh. later on, he used to joke about when he'd come into my office and he'd say, where's Corso's junk file or his nut file? Because <laughs> the items actually were in my desk and they looked like I picked them out of a wastebasket or something. <laughs> and, so, and he used to kid about that, but then he'd also get serious and say, Phil, they could change our lives or change the world. In one particular case, I didn't talk to the general. I had the, the integrated circuit chips are about like a quarter. And I mentioned to him, I told him, General, what happens, what's going to happen in the future if this chip, which was one of our most important things we had, I say number one just about, ever integrates with the human brain? And he looked, he said, yes, Phil, that's a, that's a great danger. And, but... Let's hope that people come after us will understand. He said, but I doubt if it will happen in our lifetime. Well, he, he died. I'm still here. And, it did. It's, it's, and they're working on that now. Now, in addition to that, when I started to go through the file, I found the first thing I had was a piece of metal about the size of a postcard uh -huh. and paper thin. But the atoms were lined in it. And this came from... Livermore Lab, which was one of the laboratories we financed up at MIT. And he called me in, and he said, I'm making you head of a team. You will get in Army engineers and even the German scientists. And I did two, assign two to my team. And they worked with me. So the job was to go around the industry, the first job, and see who was working on such items. So we did. We started to go to industry. In other words, IBM, the big ones, uh, who uh, were yes. working we, on... We went to... Uh, well, th these came in other factors. This particular one I'm talking about is a line of atoms. So uh, one day, when we went to one of these industries, and they had a long thing, tunnel-like thing. And at the end of the day, we, uh, right after supper... I motioned one of the German engineers, German scientists, 
I told him, why don't you take a walk with me? Uh-huh. So I went to walk with him. I told him, well, what do you think? He said, Colonel, if I believe everything I've heard today, I have to unlearn everything I've ever learned. <laughs> so I told him, Hans, you might have to. He just stopped. He said, I'll remember what you said. So from then on, and then Trudeau, when he assigned me as head of that team, made the statement, this could be bigger than Los Alamos because it can make spaceships light as a feather, can be penetrated by radiation, cosmic action. No, no gunshots could penetrate it. You're referring to the metal. The piece of metal, yet I'm still there. So we worked on that, but I have to end with a note on that piece of metal. We didn't succeed as much as we tried, and we were well. And he gave me instructions: if you think they're beginning the process, fund it. Well, in, in other words, let me be straight, Colonel. You took this to a private uh, corporation, yes. and you, you sa- in essence said, can you duplicate this, or can you make this, or can you back-engineer it? And they tried and failed. Yeah, well, let's say we all failed. We tried to, We financed it even. We never did, Anybody we assigned it to or we thought was getting close to it, oh, really never, it never had. Never did, uh, let's say... Happen. All right, this metal, this piece of metal came from where? The crash at Roswell, or did you not know? No, I knew it. The file I had had uh, papers with it describing it. And uh, where did it come from? It came from Roswell. Roswell. Now, then we moved to the integrated circuit, the size of a chip. And then General Trudeau gave me instructions. Find out who in the industry is working on similar like the transistors already started. Right. He said, any scientists are working on it, write me a plan of action on how we're going to do all this. So I finally came up with my plan and gave it to him here, okay, that, that we would find scientists and people who are working in that area, particular area, and we would infuse in there normal research and development proposals, not the item itself but proposals describing it. These are supposed to be normal R&D think tank type operations. In other words, uh, you would come up with a proposal that would suggest, for example, uh, what about the concept of developing an integrated uh, uh, circuit, an IC uh, circuit, Yes. miniaturized? Uh, yes, along that line we came up. And uh, How did you um, get that, Colonel, to the, the file. to the industry leaders? To the ind- well... We, General Trudeau started the program, what we called applied engineering, and even Dr. Teller was in on that, and he's still alive, you know. Right. And this applied engineering, here's exactly what, what we did. We found out people working in that area. We infused the technology in this through R&D projects, and we funded it. They didn't use our money. We funded the, the project. And, you... and then every time we thought they were slowing down, we would infuse maybe a little more in, and then finally the chip went over to them. All of this black budget money? No, no, this was not black budget. This was R&D money. R&D you money. us. This was money, oh, money appropriated by Congress. All right. We had a, now, in addition to that, let me tell you this, since you asked about budget. There's such a thing as R&D, T&E operation. That was research, development, and RDT and ES, and then we these type of program programs were that the first item made we would go and check where it was done. Well, it was T stood for test evaluation. I better add that on. Yes, sir. The first budget that came in was the prototype, and I I tell them when the first prototype was off the line, I'll be there to check it. You bet. Many times. It wasn't, and I even threatened sometimes. I had authority to cancel contracts. Now, since the first item, an RDT&E, was still in the R&D, and we financed that with our budget. Again, not a black budget, an open budget. Understood. Ordered by Congress. Yes. Because remember, the projects that went out were normal research and development contracts. Makes sense, yes. They weren't uh, sub rosa or anything like that. Right. Or any say, uh, we can't tell you enough. We put them out in that sense. And this program started to, to operate. And it started pretty good. Then one day, 
I pulled out of the file a bunch of wires. Well, I thought they were wires, and they were emitting colors. And there was some sort of, there must have been some sort of circuit in there or some sort of uh, power source. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know if it was a wire or it was a, a, something plastic. But finally we got, there's people working on similar time. In fact, lately I talked to some scientists who were in that area. And this was infused in, and I think one of the ones that was used in was Bell Laboratory. From that, cyber optics developed. Fiber optics. Yes. Now, also, let me get back to the whole story on the chip, on the uh, integrated circuit. All right. May I stop you and ask you, the material in those filing cabinets, was that all from Roswell? It was from Roswell, but I, I'm, uh, and sometimes I got an idea that some of it maybe came from the St. Augustine crash out here. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, you were going back to the chip. Yeah, I'm going back to the chip now. Uh, that was one of our really uh, number one imports. I found in my file a file I had in there that was labeled Project Rainbow. Rainbow. Project Rainbow was von Neumann's, John von Neumann's project. And I read it, and this was amazing. He was starting to work on artificial intelligence, artificial life. Oh, my. And, the, and I put it aside, and I locked down to look back. Was I remiss? I had the organization, the money, the, the brain, work, uh, the brain the people who do it. And I didn't. I put it away because it was, I really didn't understand it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I didn't understand everything that I had. In fact, many times I thought, we weren't that brilliant. How did you even decide where to take any item that you might have touched? what happened. General Trudeau made it a point to contact most of the industries in the Fortune 500. Right. We per he personally went to visit 25 of the boards. In fact, to give you a little story, I went with him to Sperry Rand. We met the board. In fact, who come out and met us? Martha herself. Oh. He was chairman of the board up for he. And that was, I thought myself and Yellow too. That was a great honor when MacArthur came out to see us. Oh, I course. served under him in Korea. In fact, I was standing there with them, both of them. And they were asking me questions and a little story. I wondered, well, how does this happen to me? The greatest soldier we ever had and the most brilliant soldier, and they're asking me questions. It doesn't make sense. You never actually transferred materials. You transferred well, ideas. Well, at certain stages we did. Well, you did. At certain stages. But it had to progress. For example, General Trudeau told me one day, getting back to the integrated circuit, he said, Phil, the transistor in the way it is today and the integrated circuit, took us five years to develop. It should have taken 250 years. Now, those, those were his exact words to me. Uh -huh. Now, von Neumann's project, maybe one of the reasons I did look at confused and we couldn't do it, was really the supercomputer had not come in existence then. It did come in existence to late, late years now. Right. So we weren't, and maybe I had some intuition not to fund this and start because we really were not in permission to exploit this and develop it. Supercomputers had not been developed at that stage, but they were working on it. Then I'll tell you another interesting little story. I had what we call the super tenacity fiber. It looked like string, but you couldn't burn it, you couldn't cut it with a razor blade, and we found out that they, the atom structure was, was aligned in them. That the what? The atom structure? Yes. Atomically aligned, just like the piece of metal. Just like the metal. Now, that that is a strange little story here, an interesting little story. So what did we find? The nearest thing on this earth to that was a spider web. A the spider spins an atomically aligned web. All right, Colonel, Colonel, hold it right there for a moment. We're going to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. This is Premier Networks. That was Art Bell hosting Coast to Coast AM on this Somewhere in Time. Now, we take you back to the past on Art Bell Somewhere in Time. From Bill in Fairfield, California, when Colonel Corso told his story on CNN's Talk Back Live, the older members of the audience were nodding their heads in approval, while the younger people appeared to be rolling their eyes in disbelief. To understand the Roswell cover-up, 
The reasons why it took years for individuals like Colonel Corso to come forward, you have to examine the facts in the context of post-war America. On this Independence Day weekend, I salute Colonel Corso and wish him well. I'm sure he must have agonized before coming forward. Colonel? Uh, it's me, Art, and I couldn't agree with your words more. He is truly an American hero, along with uh, General Trudeau and many others at that period of time when it was so difficult to know exactly what to do with all the complexities we're talking about tonight. And before the colonel continues with his fascinating story about uh, the government's, his R&D interest in the spider web, I wanted to quote from his book. And this had to do with the autopsies on the creatures that were retrieved from some crash somewhere in New Mexico. The medical report revealed that the creatures were enclosed within a one-piece protective covering like a jumpsuit or outer skin in which the atoms were aligned so as to provide a great tensile strength and flexibility. One examiner wrote that it reminded him of a spider's web which appears very fragile, but is in fact very strong. Linda? Yeah. It sounds an awful lot like the aliens depicted in Independence Day. Well, these are the outer garments. I understand. But yeah. if you recall, on Independence Day, they had an outer... Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, you're right. Yes. And uh, how much of fiction is uh, actually copying nonfiction because of leaks? We'll probably never know, but you're right. You're making a very good point. Well, the unique qualities of a spider web result from the alignment of fibers that provide great tenacity because they're able to stretch under great pressure, yet display a resiliency that allows them to snap back into shape even after the shock of an impact. Similarly, the creature's spacesuit or outer skin appeared to be stretched around it as if it were literally spun over the creature and seized up around it, providing a perfect skin-tight protective fit. The doctors had never seen anything like it before, unquote. And now here is Colonel Corso to continue this ex exploration of spider web tenacity. Oh, I'm back on. Yes, Colonel. Welcome back. Now, I'll finish the spider web story. Uh, these spider webs, you could stretch them for miles. They had like a hook type arrangement when they were spun. It was a line, and it would stretch. You just stretch it for miles, and I'll break it, then it'll snap back in place. So that what we did, because of its strength and tenacity in the way it all, we made flight jackets out of it. Flight jackets? And they worked very well. But the problem was we couldn't get enough spider web. So we gave a contract out to the first one I remember. And this, by the way, appeared in the Discovery Magazine story not too long ago, which I cut out. We financed the University of Wyoming. We wanted them to try to clone the spider, but... I, I'm to, sorry, I missed that, Colonel. You wanted them to what? Clone the spider. Oh, clone the spider. So we could get enough material to make flight jackets. Understood. But we never succeeded, and they never succeeded until today. I don't think it's been done. So we had to go to other fibers like Kevlar and everything, the, the way the flight jackets are made today. But it started with the stuff in your file drawer. Yes. Yeah, but it all began with that, that file drawer material. Yes, um, and that came out of my file drawer. <laughs> May I ask a, a, a question, Colonel, that jumps way ahead? Sure. Uh, what happened to all the material that was in that file drawer? Where is that material now? Well, really, I don't know. Some people have asked me at times, did you keep any? You could have kept some and made millions of dollars. Wait a minute. I was an Army officer. That's oh, I understand. To me. I understand. That was the armies. So, in other that words... My, I'm the one... That, and intelligence and sovereign security the one that should keep the people from stealing things from the army. I understand. So when you when you left, you wouldn't uh, have a, a, any idea of its chain of custody. No, I just turned it back over. Just like I can tell you this, I didn't know the chain of custody even before that I got it. So I never. And then actually, when I retired, I wasn't even in the army anymore, and I don't. I have no idea today. I asked some officers not too long ago that I know to try to keep it quiet, and I told them where I thought the file could be. But it's up to somebody else to, change, uh, to track, it, track it down because I can't do it. I'm not in the Army anymore. 
Uh-huh. And his, uh, oh. All right. Yes. Jeff, one of the other units or pieces in this uh, amazing file cabinet that Colonel Corswell had, in the book, he raises this. He said, why did the inhabitants of the craft have a cutting device that when they had it, they could see that there was some kind of a red dot coming out of a black piece that they had, one of these file cabinet uh, technologies they did not understand, and they didn't know what it was. And finally, one time that they saw some smoke in the room, and suddenly they could see this red beam of light, and of course what I'm describing is what we now know as a laser, Laser, they didn't know. And he said, why did the inhabitants of this craft have a cutting device like this aboard their ship? It wasn't until later when I read military reports of cattle mutilations in which entire organs were removed without any visible trauma to the surrounding cell tissue that I realized that the light beam cutting torch I thought was in the Roswell file was actually a surgical implement, just like a scalpel that was being used by the aliens in medical experiments on our livestock, unquote. I would like now to turn the phone back to Colonel Corso to describe his first handling of this device. Well, my first handling was I had another device that was similar to this one. And, of course, like a human doesn't know any better, I figured the batteries are dead. I couldn't turn it on. <laughs> and there was no batteries in it. But that was the first reaction of, of a typical reaction of, some, of a human that doesn't know anything. Would have been mine. <laughs> And later on, well, it was mine, too, and I was in charge. But later on, like the other little instrument I had, which I think measured the intensity of uh, brain waves on different organs of the body, uh-huh. that particular thing, I thought, I, I, I thought it, the battery was dead in that also. And I took it to a uh, lab down at Belvoir. And lo and behold, when it, some radiation area, I went in, uh, the thing came on. When you went into a, an area where there was radiation? Well, there was actually, we had the low, low level of radiation because that was our atomic lab, the one we kept that they didn't take away from us. And so when it got into that area, it turned on? It turned on. Of course, it had graduated things, and I shipped that to Monument also because they were our electronic labs. Yes, sir. And there, I didn't, it wasn't our deep project because they were our labs and they were military. Thing. And I, I never did get a because I left after, well, not too long after, when General Trudeau retired, and six months later I did. But I shipped it to them, and uh, that, that was the, those two interesting little items. And uh, the laser, then the second most important thing after the circuit that I think we did was our development on lasers. A lot of people believe that the laser was started before. Well, there were experiments before, yes, way back. But the thing blossomed and took hold on lasers in 1960, and even General Beach, who took General Trudeau's place, made that remark in public. When you turned that device over? I turned them over to Monmouth, our electronic labs. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, not Long Island, Island. yes. Sir. They were our electronic yeah. labs. And then uh, also... Did you then follow the progress of the back engineering? Well, yes, I followed them for a time, but then... Now, also another thing, I, I, I better inject this right now. Much as it seems now when they read the book and all, that people think how important they're seeking. This was not my primary job. This was like a secondary job. What was your primary job? Well, my primary job was Special Assistant Chief R&D, for example, budgets. And I was a speci- the first officer, I'm uh, the first project officer on the anti-missile missile. Trudeau assigned that to me, the importance of it, because the brain from the extraterrestrial could be, it was going, it, it could, it had four lobes. They could uh, integrate back and forth electromagnetically. And we did some similar work out on our ICBMs, our Inter- yeah. International Continental Listals. So we did that, and we used uh, uh, these items on, on that. Uh, we went along that line. And then I'll jump ahead a little bit. We had what we call, well, a laser developed, and we had to be very careful with that weapon we developed, which really had gone into Star Wars. Actually, the weapon weapon could go 300,000 kilometers a second, and their plane traveled on the speed of sound, there was no lead time. I think they, they calculated they would travel one millimeter before the ray hit it. Uh, what uh, weapon was this? Dew weapon. Direct energy weapon. 
direct energy weapon. We had to be careful. It was dangerous. One doctor, he, he wrote an article that I have a copy of, a little paragraph. He said, the most frightening thing in my life happened to me. My eye popped out and started to bleed inside. He said, I never had such a frightening experience, and it came from looking at the ray. So we had to be careful with these things, too, because we didn't know all the what it would do altogether. So this was uh, what was later developed in the do weapon, and also we found out a very serious thing uh, during that period. In fact, the project officer took my place in the... the uh, uh, in the, as a special projects officer of the anti-missile missile, he came to me one day and he said, Phil, we got, he was a colonel too, he said, we got an awful thing. We better, and he said, the Soviets can change its trajectory, their, their ICBM missiles in midair. So, my God, we better go to Trudeau, the general, right now. Uh -huh. That was almost a little frightening because we, if we couldn't hit him, look at the danger we were in. Of course. So that became a, a crash project. And the answer was really the new weapon. Direct energy weapon. Because it could get so fast, so quick on the target. That it wouldn't matter how it moved. You couldn't evade it. Like our, our radars, like the, the radars I had at Red Canyon here in, in White Sands on my Nike missiles, we had a pencil beam that could lock on. Uh, Colonel, uh, was this some sort of electromagnetic pulsing weapon? It was a, it was a similar, to, it was... It came from the laser family. Let's put it that way. Uh -huh. I have the pamphlets. The pamphlets I have at the Army send me, non-classified. I have them uh, with me. Uh, they were they all dated 1961, 62, and 63. So that's and then also there was another thing which I tell you happened. This is an interesting little story. I have a pamphlet written by General Britton, head of Army Material Command, in 1963. On the front page, there's a, a photograph. Of a, a cart we built, three-wheeled cart. Yes. This three-wheeled cart, we took the integrated circuit in it, and instead of putting electricity in it, we put water in them. The, the cart ran on, ran on water. And when I told Senator Glenn this, he got so interested, I had to give him the photograph and told him, Senator, it was right up here, Harry Diamond Lab in North Park, Washington, Adelphia. Maybe you can call him and go up and see if it's still there. A process, was it utilizing hydrogen from no. water? Water. Yes, but the hydrogen from the water. Well, uh, I don't know if it broke down to that. It was still liquid. It wasn't. It didn't turn to gas. Didn't turn to gas. And I gave it to Gen Senator Glenn. In fact, that particular meeting I had with Senator Glenn, uh, there was an interesting comment that comes out of that. I asked the senator, and I think he'll verify because we, we uh, I, I, should, I had the appointment for half an hour, and he spent an hour and a half with me, and he had people waiting. I mentioned flying saucers to him, and he saw his mind. He said, you know, Colonel, I'm an agnostic. I told him, but, Senator, you didn't say you don't believe, and he laughed. <laughs> and so that was, and then uh, for the first time, I sent to the Army, Army Historical Branch Engineers, and I told them where it was and what it was, and if they'd look it up and send me a copy. This was Project Horizon, the military colony on the moon, which we did in 1959. A military colony on the moon. It's the appendix. Uh, Fifty pages of it is the appendix in my book. In fact, the first moon land, there, there's a photograph of it in there. We we did that. We had some of the best brains in the country, I think, working on it. One brown scientist and all. And when defense found out that, and they took the civilian top, took uh, everything away from us and, and organized NASA, they killed it on us. We were never able to do anything on it. I declassified for General Trudeau, and it lay there in the files for years. But what you're suggesting, Colonel, is that we had spacecraft and the ability to colonize the moon, which we, you're saying we did, and at the same time we were developing a space program that, uh, as compared to it, was uh, like a Model A to a, a it modern was the BMW. Of the Gemini and the other satellite. And uh, lately, a friend of mine, a scientist, who met with Atlanta with the NASA's top people, and he threw Project uh, Horizon, the 310 pages on the table, and they were flabbergasted. After all these years, it was dead in the files until I pulled. In fact, if you look in the appendix of the book, in the front page of Horizon, you'll see right on top where it's secret and it's crossed off. Uh, the secret is crossed off because I declassified that for the general. And this is the first appearance it makes in public. 
Project mm -hmm. Horizon. And uh, that went on for how many years? Well, they killed it on us in, in about 1961. The Department of Defense just said nothing to them. No appropriation, nothing. Forget it. Could it have continued, Colonel, without your knowledge? It didn't continue. No, I had knowledge. I had... No, you know, the, uh, although I retired from the Army, I had friends there. We trusted each other. We talked uh, uh, many times. I, I lived in Arlington, Virginia. I was close by. I saw these boys. No, it did not continue. Why would, Unfortunately. A, why would a project capable of put, uh, putting a colony on the moon not continue? Well, I think Bill Burns testified that there was a, he came out with this, there was a, a battle of, uh, let's say, uh, territory or whatever you want to call it, of appropriation, so there was a terrific battle going on inside the government which people didn't know about. And this thing, let's say, got caught in the battle. They didn't like the Army. They didn't like us. The civilian heads, and uh, out of, I mean, out of the military, you know, they didn't like us very much, and they wanted to pull us down. And anything we did was try to take it away from us. And unfortunately, this project with the moon lander in there, a picture of the moon lander, it's in there. They just destroyed it on us. They made us quit, stop. We got orders of no more. God. And the project died. And there's all the photographs. In fact, uh, she, uh, right here, she has right in her hand a book. And what's the page number? Uh, Colonel, uh, why don't you hand the phone to Linda Howe for just one moment, if you yeah. will, sir? Okay, Linda, for one moment. All right. Linda, um, yeah. uh, two things very quickly. One, um, I I'm trying to make sense of all this. The, elect uh, the electromagnetic, uh, 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 the direct energy weapon he mentioned, right. in my mind, might translate to an electromagnetic pulsing weapon. And as you know, in STS 48 and 80, we see things occurring that um, look very much like an electromagnetic pulsing weapon. Right. Uh, point one. Point two, I'm finding it very hard to understand how a project that colonized the moon uh, prior to our, or as our space program was just getting off the ground, could have possibly been dropped, uh, even with budget wars going on, or the uh, you, you know using that technology to have done all that and then just drop the project? Yes, and I'm going to in just a few minutes. I'm going to transfer this back to Mr. Burns to explain that art. But I want you to hear uh, excerpts from the actual now unclassified by uh, by Colonel Corso. This is a paragraph signed by Arthur G. Trudeau. About Lieutenant one General. minute, Linda. Chief of Research and Development in the Pentagon. I envision expeditions development of the proposal to establish a lunar outpost to be of critical importance to the United States Army of the future. This evaluation is apparently shared by the Chief of Staff in view of his expeditious approval and enthusiastic endorsement of initiation of the study, which said there is a requirement for a manned military outpost on the moon. The lunar outpost is required to develop and protect potential United States interests on the moon to develop techniques in moon-based surveillance of the Earth and space in communications relay and in operations on the surface of the moon to serve as a base for like, exploration of the moon for further exploration into space and for military operations on the moon if required and to support scientific investigations on the moon. All right, we come back, we'll have... Um, uh, Belinda, I need to understand. Uh, yeah. w did the colonel say that we actually did that, went to the moon? Oh, no. Or, or was... only that it was proposed based on the technology we, we were developing or trying to develop? Yeah, General Trudeau wanted this done, and this was all drawn up a, a, as a plan, and it was going forward like okay. an extension of General Trudeau's getting these artifacts. I understand. I understand. I'm and glad... suddenly, we... it was, the rug was pulled out from under them. Okay, uh, I've got it. Thank you, Linda. And my guests are whew, Colonel Philip J. Corso, retired, and William J. Burns, as well as, of course, uh, Linda Moulton Howe. I'm Art Bell. What a night, huh, folks? Just the right weekend for this. The trip back in time continues with Art Bell hosting Coast to Coast AM. More Somewhere in Time coming up. Listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. Welcome to the program, those of you who join at this hour. 
anything is possible tonight, anything at all. Who knows? But then again, that's kind of the way I like it. My guest, Philip J. Corso, uh, Colonel Corso, now retired, uh, fits squarely into that category. And, Linda, I assume you're on the line? Yes, and during this break, Art, I learned from the colonel that tomorrow he will be at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque signing his books on that military base. A huge irony after these 50 years. It certainly And is. the Pentagon in Washington can't keep enough of the books in stock. And... As they both said, if that isn't a signal that this book is full of truth, that people that are the inside today want this book, that is it. It's astounding. Linda, I want to read this to you and just see if it resonates. Um, from Sean in Yucca Valley, I've heard from several people who work in high technology that the carrying capacity of fiber optics is so great that, get this, no future replacement for it is even being considered. Do you know if it's true? If it's the case, have you ever heard of another a terrestrial-derived technology so robust that further development is deemed unnecessary? Well, I'm going to have the colonel try to address that after we had decided that what we would do next, because this is so important, yes. so many people want to know about the big black eyes, and everybody has probably, in listening to this uh, radio program, has seen the uh, controversial Centelli film in which yes. these beings, a surgeon lifts off a thin black lens off of both eyes, and right. they go somewhere. Right. I'm going to read to you briefly from Colonel Corso's own words. I was most interested in the file descriptions accompanying a two-piece set of dark elliptical eyepieces as thin as skin, and these are part of this file drawer kind of stuff. The Walter Reed pathologist said they adhered to the lenses of the extraterrestrial creature's eyes and seemed to reflect existing light. And the Walter Reed pathologists are the ones who did some of the initial autopsies on beings retrieved from New Mexico, even in what looked like complete darkness, so as to illuminate and to intensify images in the darkness to allow their wearer to pick out shapes. The reports had said that the pathologist at Walter Reed Hospital, who autopsied one of these creatures, tried himself to peer through them in the darkness to watch the one or two army sentries and medical orderlies walking down a corridor adjacent to the pathology lab. These figures were illuminated in a greenish-orange, depending upon how they moved, but the pathologist could see only their outer shape. And when they got close to each other, their shapes blended into a single form, but they could also see the outlines of furniture and the wall and objects on desktops. Colonel Corso now speaking, maybe. I thought as I read this report, soldiers could wear a visor that intensified images through the reflection and amplification of available light and navigate in the darkness of a battlefield with as much confidence as if they were walking their sentry posts in broad daylight. But these eyepieces didn't turn night into day. They only highlighted the exterior shapes of things. I'm now going to ask the colonel if he has any further explanation about just the outlining and then to go on uh, further with this whole issue, is fiber optics so advanced that there's nothing else that we know beyond? Here's Colonel Corso. Colonel? I'm back on then. All right. Uh, is the technology Linda just talked about um, what we now know as night vision? Yes, yes. It's, it's imaging that intensifies. It's night vision. We call it a <sighs> night vision lab. My, my. It belonged to us. It, it was financed by us and belonged to us. Now, to, continue, to tell you a little story right at the end of what Linda, uh, she just read to you, uh, General Trudeau called me one day and said, Phil, here's an envelope. It's a budget of the night viewing laboratory. Now, you go down with your inspection team, and I took German scientists and engineers, and see how they're doing, how they're progressing. If you're happy, give them the budget. So I went to Fort Belvoir, and the colonel received this, told me at the exit interview, he said, we were a little leery when we heard you were coming down. 
I told him, is my reputation that bad or am I a hatchet man? And I told him, well, in this case, it might be a little different. I told him, you're doing a good job. And you know, notice my German friend over there, he never smiles, but he smiled, so he liked what he saw. So for a change, I think I'll play Santa Claus. <laughs> I told him, here's your, take this envelope, it's yours. The decision is left to me to give it to you or not. You're doing a good job. He opened it up. It was a $60 million budget. <laughs> and I told him this. I said, now, there's a little hitch to that. You don't get that free. A war is heating up in Vietnam. Give us a night viewing device in three to six months. They did. <laughs> so that's the, the little story about the night viewing device. And Linda Redd, you... And now also, to go back beyond this, the Germans had an infrared, which was very good. And we took that. We also did infuse that. And I had a great advantage. Not only did I have the German documents, but I had German scientists who could read it and explain it to me. Colonel, may I stop you and ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, after the war, sir, it is my understanding that there was a general division of German scientists between the United States and Russia. Um, is it... Uh, do you have knowledge that the Russians got any German scientists who were privy to the same uh, technology that, that the Germans had even prior to the war? Now, I discussed the same problem with some of my German scientists. They claim that, that the Russians did get some German scientists, but not of the caliber that we had. We had, remember, we had Albert. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Albert was a genius. He ranks with Goddard. We had von Braun. Actually, Obert was von Braun's boss. And we had the other Germans, including the two I had on my team. Brilliant men. Now, they claim that they knew about a lot of these things, but didn't know enough to put them in production. In fact, later in the war, they were working on things. They were forced to work on things like this. But I'm beginning to believe, and from what they said in my interrogation and the year I spent with them, that the same thing happened over there that happened here. There were groups of combat officers, like we had an affinity between us. Right. There was no paper trail. We trusted each other just from head to head. And nothing was ever, nothing ever got out because these men were, were not, you couldn't get these men to talk or say anything. And the, we didn't like the elite in our government because we didn't trust them. And I understand in Germany, there was a similar thing. The scientists did not like the Nazis. And I understand that possibly there was the same thing in Russia. If you read the, the middle photograph in my book, it shows a picture of General Trudeau and myself standing by the flag. On my right, I think, is Edward O'Connor. He was one of Truman's poker playing buddies. And the expert at the White House on Soviet at the NASC, with the same division I was in. On the other hand, is Victor Fadai, Library of Congress. Librarian, he's one of the top men, and then he went to the Foreign Relations Committee, he's a great friend of mine, fluent in, in, in Russian. So Victor was going to uh, Russia, and I told him, Victor, I'm going to give you some questions to ask. Would you ask your KGB general friend these questions? So later, Victor came back, he said, he's sort of laughing. he said, Phil, I asked him questions, he looked at me, he said, I know what you want, but Victor, do you want me killed? Well, that would indicate then they had a some similar of, thing. Uh, you betcha. Yes. All right, uh, Colonel, I, I I can't let this interview end uh, without asking you. At the end of your first interview, the exclusive interview you did with Dateline, yes. uh, you made a comment about a time machine, and uh, they seem to use that comment of yours. Uh, as a way to almost try and discredit, you know, the, the commentator sort of rolled his eyes, to sort of discredit everything else you had said. Uh, so I've got to ask you about that. May I ask you about that? Yes. Well, what, what did you book, mean? In the book, there's a part in there where I discussed this with Professor Obert. We discussed uh, time travel. But it was a discussion in those days about the possibility of time travel, and even the British were working on this. Uh, I had some documents and things I looked at, but they weren't, and then the, if you go back to the Philadelphia experiment, 
Yes, sir. There were some ramifications in there which something disappeared and moved in, in space. And even Einstein's theories talk about zero travel time in his theories. And that was very unfortunate. Well, not the White House. I didn't go up and see Einstein. I should have. And I missed out on talking to the greatest mind that ever lived. Awesome. And then I also discussed this with Wilbur Smith, the Canadian genius, who was treated very badly by his government. So, and he brought us also a piece of metal. So as far as that, these factors that I just said enter into this. But the main item was that I did discuss this with Herman Obert, and Obert thought himself, now not me because I didn't know that much about it, uh -huh. his opinion was that it is possible. That time travel is possible. That was Herman Obert. So it, the I'm reference... Not much more brilliant than I was. So then the, the reference to time travel was, it's something I'll tell you about, and you would have said what you just now said, not that you saw or traveled in time or saw a time machine or anything I like it. Never traveled in time. I wish I could. <laughs> I'd like to do that. All right. I'm glad we cleared fact, that up. lately I had an operation my thumb. I had a use hernia, and the, the doctor pulled it down, a good friend of mine, now I can eat apple pie and ice cream at night and go to sleep like a baby. <laughs> and I told him, Doc, what would you do, push me back 40 years younger? And I, I, I haven't been able to do that in 40 years. So maybe I did travel back a little bit. Well, medically. I'd like very much to travel in time if I could. Well, I'm glad to have cleared that up because they were using that to discredit you. Yeah, they did. But they didn't ask him. They had so much good material they never used. I can't understand that. But that's their business. They're in the business, and I'm not. So they were free to use what they did. Were you... Example, when, when you got to see the interview, sir, after uh, it was all done and when it aired, were you surprised at what did not air? No, I was not, because I had testified before the MIA committees, and I stood in front of Senator Curry and Senator McMahon and others, and I told them, now the interview that I did when I talked to President Eisenhower on the prisoner issue, we agreed to cover the intelligence aspect on the re of spies that they were feeding back, taking our boy boy's identity, and then getting the Russian to adopt that identity and send him back as here to the States as a spy. We agreed to, but President Eisenhower never told me to cover the, the prisoners going to Russia. In fact, he gave me permission to put out the numbers, which I did in Associated Press and, and speeches to the, I wrote for Lodge in the United Nations. And yet the newspapers took the sensational thing that Eisenhower hid the prisoner going to Russia from the families. Of course. That never happened. So I had a little experience in this type of, re type of reporting. I understand. Colonel, uh, earlier I asked your co-author, um, Ms. Burns, Bill Burns, um, what kind of agony and thought process you went through before you came forward with all of this incredible oh, oh, information. It wasn't really agony, uh, let me explain what I, how, why I decided to write the book. Please. First thing, he explained, I had a note with the general. An honorable, honest, good man. I was an army officer. I wasn't about to break my oath to him. And he released me from the oath, he said, when he died. Three years ago, unfortunately, he died. I was released from my oath. Then I could talk if I wanted to. Uh -huh. I'm criticized by my own son and family. He said, 35 years, you didn't even tell us. Sure. Why should I tell you? I had an oath. And one day my grandchildren asked me, said, Granddad, what did you do during the war? I figured I'd better stop putting this on paper and at least leave them a legacy. From that, that I was writing my experiences, it evolved with what we have now. And that's how it came about. And that's really the story, a very simple story. But this I is... I didn't go through any agony or anything. I, no well, one has ever told me not to talk. I understand. But this is such incredible information that surely you must have at least considered the impact on society. Yes. Really General Trudeau told me one day, Phil, you and I go from one development to the other, and we take it as a matter of course in our daily work, yes. and we think nothing of it, yet some of these things are earth-shaking. These were General Trudeau's words. So we had to learn to live with that type of, uh, of thinking. And it was the same as almost like thinking in combat. You have to live with it. I tell people, I can tell you what it was like, but I can't tell you how it felt. You have to be there yourself. How much of the material, uh, Colonel, that was in those file cabinets was developed into products we use today percentage-wise versus how much we couldn't was in there that we simply couldn't do anything with? Very little. I'd say that we've developed maybe 
maybe less than 5%. We developed some very yeah. important things now for the world. So in other words, somewhere there's still a lot of material that somebody's working very hard on. Exactly. I think there is, because like Mr. Burns said, the a flying saucer itself is a capacitor. And the reason a lot of the crafts have been trying to build because they miss out that the extraterrestrial is really the guide system. He blends with the, the with the, the capacitor. God, I've heard that from so many sources. Yeah, and we came to that conclusion also. In fact, I think one of the greatest things we were, we were remiss that we didn't do more work to study this clone of this creature or whatever he is. We should have done a lot more. We should have diagnosed him and studied it minutely. So there were actually those eye covers in the, in the cabinet as well, and that's and that's what led to uh, night vision goggles. Yes, it was a, it was actually uh, the middle uh, the third eyelid. It like something like a camel. You know, he has another eyelid which blocks the sand out. Yes, it was similar. So we have something similar in this world. Although this in here, remember these creatures walked around in the dark. You know, how could they see in the dark if they didn't have something like that? My boys. And one of the requirements when I went to the night vision lab is make a night vision device which can fit over the soldier's eye almost like goggles. Yes. Not something bulky and big which he can't wear. And has to carry, he has to put it on. A, a soldier operates in combat. He can't be carrying a, everything looking through it out around. You see, so, and they did. They did it. I, give them, I have a pamphlet that they wrote, and I give them credit. They did perform and, and made it. And it was our home laboratory that did it, too. All right, Colonel. We've got to hold it there for a moment. Stand by. We'll get back to you. Colonel Philip J. Corso. You know, uh, it's hard to know what to say to this kind of information, except... Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm Art Bell on Independence Day weekend. It's a good, good weekend for this sort of thing, eh? You're listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. Bell, somewhere in time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. I wonder if you understand the magnitude of what you're hearing this morning or this evening, whenever you're listening to it. A retired colonel, Philip J. Corso, who was in the right place, definitely the right place at the right time, is telling us that the majority of the advanced technology that we have today didn't come from us. to Roswell. Linda? And Art, I am looking at page 115 in the book, The Day After Roswell, and it says, among the Roswell artifacts and the questions and issues that arose from the Roswell crash are my preliminary, and I'm quoting Colonel uh, Corso, list, that needed resolution for development, scheduling, or simple inquiries to our military scientific community were image intensifiers, which ultimately became night vision, fiber optics, which were fed into the phone system and a whole lot of other things, super tenacity fibers that we have just discussed that were related somewhat to the way fiber or way spider webs are so strong, lasers, molecular alignment metallic alloys, integrated circuits, and micro miniaturization of logic boards, uh, Project Horizon, which we're going to talk a little bit more about here in a minute, portable atomic generators, which ion propulsion drive, irradiated food, particle beams, and he puts in here parenthesis, Star Wars anti-missile energy weapons, right. electromagnetic propulsion systems, and depleted uranium projectiles. This is in a section of the book about some of the R&D development projects that he and General Trudeau were initiating and that have evolved to today. And there's one more thing before we go forward in time. We've been trying to understand the bismuth magnesium layered material that may have come from the bottom of a delta-shaped craft. Yes. Other people are trying to understand what other kind of pieces and particles they may have. 
I thought one of the most extraordinary uh, paragraphs in this book reads, The initial revelations into the nature of the spacecraft and its pilot interface and he specifies there were hand-imprinted panels exactly as we have seen in the debris footage in the controversial Santilli videotape. Yes. They came very quickly during the first few years of testing at Norton Air Force Base in California. The Air Force discovered that the entire vehicle functioned just like a giant capacitor. In other words, the craft itself stored the energy necessary to propagate the magnetic wave that elevated it allowed it to achieve escape velocity from the Earth's gravity, and enabled it to achieve speeds of over 7,000 miles an hour. In other words, the craft, the outer uh, portion of the craft might have been made of an anti-gravitic material, much like bismuth magnesium. That's right. The pilots weren't affected by the tremendous G-forces that build up in the acceleration of conventional aircraft, because to aliens inside, it was as if gravity was being folded around the outside of the wave that enveloped the craft. Right. It may have been like traveling inside the eye of a hurricane, but how did the pilots interface with the waveform they were generating? Linda, as I hear all this, I'm just sitting here shaking my head. It's all coming together. It is, it is. And he and uh, Colonel Corso says, somehow the pilots became part of the electrical storage and generation of the craft itself. They, they didn't just pilot or navigate the vehicle. They became part of the electrical circuitry of the vehicle, vectoring it in a way similar to the way you order a voluntary muscle to move. The vehicle was simply an extension of their own bodies because it was tied into their neurological systems in ways that even today we are just beginning to utilize and the thing that they discovered in those uh, tight-fitting suits is that the molecules of the fibers themselves were all oriented in the same way. Right. And he speculated that when this whole craft system, the hands are in the panels, the craft is moving, it is lifted in a magnetic wave, and that those fibers all oriented helped make the entire system generate as a whole system without affecting these pilots. Well, Linda, we are working on exactly that technology, uh, r rudimentary stages, uh, albeit, but I've seen a number of specials on television about pilots literally thinking, not having to push buttons and pull levers and uh, sticks and so forth and so on, but literally thinking commands. That's right. And from... Colonel Corso, tonight, I hope everybody listening realizes that over the last 50 years, some of our major technological breakthroughs started in file cabinets in the Pentagon after they had been transferred from craft sites in the southwest of the United States through Wright-Patterson into areas of the Pentagon and other parts, probably uh, Dreamland, Area 51 in Nevada and other sure. places, and that today... We are listening to the voice of a man who was there, who knows that this is the real thing. And what I'm intrigued also by is that General Trudeau, who when you begin to read some of the history about his life and his intellect, was an extraordinary man, uh, a man who had an electrical engineering degree, who was a perfect for understanding and relating to Colonel Corso. Of course. That they knew the implications and how important it was to get it out into our country and not in the hands of enemies and further because there were animal mutilations because there were human abductions and they had been monitoring since the end of the 50s they felt it was so important to get a base on our own moon to monitor what we'll call extraterrestrial biological entity traffic coming in and out of our earth and what might be on the moon and that General Trudeau's Project Horizon was his answer to getting this done. And suddenly, from left field, comes a closed down. And I'd like to go to William Burns now to try to help us understand what happened to close down this brilliant general and this brave colonel trying to get all of this going forward so that the Earth would not be so vulnerable. Here is William Burns. Okay. Hi, uh, Hi. Hi, Mr. I want to go back to this whole concept of 
this war going on inside the Beltway. Yes. And obviously, nobody is going to say to General Trudeau, to the to Army R&D, well, look, fellas, I think you're too close to getting a beat on these ETs, so we got to shut you down because we're making a deal with them for the planet Earth. <laughs> That's not what happened on the surface. I have my doubts about what was happening underneath. Mm -hmm. In reality, what was being said, the pretext, everything happens with a pretext. The pretext was very clear. You've got three military services fighting for one military budget. How do you carve up the military pie? You've heard this a million times from other sure. defense secretaries. How do you carve the pie up? Of course. Well, if the Army is building rockets, if the Navy is building rockets, if the Air Force is building rockets, you have three rockets, three development streams, three R&Ds, three this, three this. No, combine it into one. But you boys in the military can't stop fighting with each other. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make a civilian agency that will be responsible to the Defense Department for funneling military missions into a civilian organized program. And on the surface, that's good old-fashioned Americana. That's the way it's supposed to work. However, there was a much deeper and more sinister aspect to this. One, it wasn't all that clean to begin with, because who was part and parcel of the management of this? It was the civilian intelligence government. It was the civilian intelligence agencies. This was being run in part out of the CIA. Well, how do we know this? Bill, do you have any tangible proof? Tell me one thing that you can show that the CIA was somehow involved in NASA to the point where it was utilizing NASA for its own purposes. Well, I'll give you one tangible thing. Please. Project Corona. Remember, as the colonel himself said on, on prime time, you had American surveillance overflights of the Soviet Union. Oh, yes. You had them to the point while we were developing a redundant system, which was satellite surveillance. But we had no military satellites at that point. We're talking the late 50s. What did we have? NASA sending monkeys into space, and it looked really cute on the movie tone news. What the movie tone news didn't show you was that the CIA went to Lockheed Skunk Works and said to Skunk Works, they're starting to get a bead on our surveillance overflights. The colonel himself said that one of the main reasons for U-2 flights was to draw the Soviet surface-to-air missile fire to see when the missiles went hot, when the radar went hot, and could they shoot down our planes. We sacrificed a lot of pilots, those are his words, on prime time just a couple of years ago. And this is documented. Again, people said, oh, who is this guy saying this? Who is this guy, Corso? They found in the National Archives that everything that Corso was saying was documented in black and white, and it's at the Eisenhower Library even today. So there you are. You've got a civilian space agency which has superseded the military space missions. But who's running it? The CIA is putting camera satellites in a civilian mission, taking photos of the Soviet Union and showing they could do it. So we know the CIA was involved in NASA even, at the, even from the very beginnings. NASA was a way for the CIA to get control of the space program. So the pretext was budget, the pretext was competition, but what happened when we had a NASA? Through a budget that had no congressional oversight, you had Project Corona taking pictures of the Soviet Union. It was very laudable, but of course who was analyzing those photos wasn't the Army, wasn't the Navy, wasn't the Air Force, it was the CIA, which then gave back false estimates. But the point is that it was a pretext. The civilian space agency was a pretext for the real advances that the military had already made in space missions. By the time we were monkeying, no pun intended, with Project Corona in 1959, on the drawing boards was a full-blown capable of being funded with its own separate command structure, a military outpost on the moon. But it was a military outpost on the moon that wasn't just looking down on planet Earth, but out into orbital space because we were not just monitoring Soviets, we were monitoring extraterrestrial traffic. And that's what the CIA was trying to keep from the American people. Oh, my God. Um, and you know, Art, at this point, one of the most germane questions is, did President Kennedy 
realize these facts that he just outlined, and could that have been part of the reason for that extremely famous quote about, I want to take the CIA and tear it into a thousand pieces and cast it to the wind? Yes. Now, uh, Mr. Burns is pointing to the colonel, so here is Colonel Corso. Okay. Oh, I'm back. Hi, Colonel. Uh, 1962, I testified, well, first, they asked me to testify for my four years at the White House and how policy was made and run and the names. I turned them down. They came to my house even. There was some inter Senate Internal Security Subcommittee on this and Judiciary. Yes, sir. And the council called me. And I came up. I was still in uniform. I went up there. And he said, I want you to testify. I told him, no, I'm not going to testify. And you put it in the archives and the guy that's dust. For what, what reason should I? And he leaned over. He's a big, gruff man. He's a sawine. And, and he said, Colonel, I'll subpoena you. And I looked like I said, go ahead, subpoena me. Be, yeah, I get a hundred subpoenas. You can't make me talk if I don't want to. Uh -huh. So he started to laugh. Laugh, and I thought, what's going on? And from then on, till the, till the gentleman died, we were great friends. <laughs> so he looked at me, and he said, somebody like you always wants something. What do you want? So much simple what I want. I'll testify if you can promise me that you'll put it in the hands of the Kennedy brothers, President and Attorney General. Come up tomorrow. I came up the next day. I went to meet Senator Eastland, chairman of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Senator Eastland told me, he said, Colonel, I promise you I'll put it in their hands myself, personally. So, Senator, call your committee. I'm ready to testify. And uh, Dirksen presided. Keating was there. McClellan. All the, these powerful senators were there to hear this. I testified for two days. Even in front of the House Committee uh, Lately, I testified on the missing prisoners. The word came up. So they won't release it. It's still top secret because it names the names in CIA. And I told them I went to get it. I wanted my testimony. And they told me they couldn't give it to me because they had to protect the source. And then the audience, I said, wait a minute, I'm the source. I don't want to be protected. And the audience decided to clap, and the newspaper men even. But this is what was going on. So to get back to the real story, though, then about two weeks later, I get a call, the Pentagon says, the Attorney General wants to see you. So I, I go across the bridge, went over, and I went to Attorney General Robert Kennedy's office. And he had my testimony, two volumes, right on his desk in front of him. So the first thing I said, and I sat down, I told him, Attorney General, if you and your brother think you make policy, you're sadly mistaken. <laughs> his answer was, I know that, Colonel. I read your book, your testimony, partially, but you and I have to discuss this more thoroughly. Colonel, so, uh, uh, well, let me finish. Just sure, please. So, during the course of discussions I had with him, because I went up more than once, UFOs came up, and I told some of the story to Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Now, I don't know this. I can't verify it. It was his affair, not mine. I think he discussed this with his brother, the president. So that's the story that I have to say of my relationship with the two Kennedys and especially Attorney General Robert Kennedy. And all I have to say, I wish he'd become president. Colonel, how old are you now? I... Linda, I wanted to ask the Colonel one other question very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Colonel, how old are you now? 82. 82. Colonel, um, how many other people are there that you're aware of I uh, can't tell you the number. That could tell the story. Well, I can't tell you the number because I lost track of them because we had, there was an agreement, even it's a code in motion pictures in the media, I think you know this, we never reveal the source or reveal someone's name or something unless we get their permission. So you may be one of the last. I may be. No. A lieutenant general called me. He was a colonel with me. And he told me, Phil... I know all about when you were chairman or head of the committee to investigate the line of Adams. So he's still alive. As I say, I don't know. Maybe in the group, the loop, the, the, even this gentleman called it. You were in the loop. I wasn't. He was a colonel and also. Uh, he said, I know how close you were to General Trudeau. He said, I heard some of the things that you people used to talk about. So how many of the loop that he called it are still alive? I really don't know. I couldn't tell you. The 35, it's been almost 40 years. I lost track. I've heard it, that some of them died. Sure, they, some of them were older than I was. And I'm 82 years old. 
Colonel, uh, we're about out of time. It has been an honor for me uh, to speak with you, and I think you're a patriotic person. Well, thank you. Colonel, thank you, and if you'll hand the phone back to Linda. Mm -hmm. Art, don't you feel that for the first time that we are hearing honest voices uh, from inside a por portion of this government that is beginning to explain all the questions we've been asking for the last five years? Yes, Linda, I do. I, um, I just, I, I just, I don't, I don't know what to say after hearing all of this. I don't know what to say. I'm, um, I, you know, one thing stunned. I'll just put in here, I know, and a footnote, when I met the colonel two nights ago, the first thing he said to me, he said, Linda, how, how did you get all of that classified material in your books? <laughs> and he said, and how did you do it? Alone, he said. At least I had a gun, <laughs> <laughs> and I think part of this big story is that we've had this huge civilian curiosity with so many people, like the ones in Roswell. This 50th anniversary, they knew, they have known, they had their hands on, and we have pushed. And then there has been people like uh, Colonel Corso, who had a gentleman's agreement with an extraordinary general who did finally pass, but his order, his order was for Colonel Corso to then tell the story. And now we may begin to see that the civilian effort that's been pushing forward. Maybe we'll there. break it all open. Linda, we're out of time. That's it. I mean, we're flat out. All um, right. It's been great, Art. It's a landmark program. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank the Colonel. This is Premier Networks. That was Art Bell hosting Coast to Coast AM on this Somewhere in Time. You're listening to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. All right, first of all, uh, Dr. John B. Alexander, uh, a little bit of background on him educationally, uh, the University of Nebraska at Omaha, BGS in sociology, 1971, Pepperdine University in 1975, an MA in education there, Walden University, a Ph.D. in education in 1980, University of California, Los Angeles School of Engineering and Applied Science Engineering Management Program in 1990, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Sloan School of Management, Executive Program in Management of Complex Organizations in 1991, and Harvard University, John F. Kennedy School of Government, Program for Senior Executives in National and International Security, 1993. Uh, Dr. Alexander has been um, an investigator of and a developer of non-lethal warfare systems. He is an absolutely fascinating person, and I trust that we have him on the line. Dr. Alexander? Great. Uh, good. We've got you. Um, and I've got a fax here that says, Hi, Art. This is really not complicated. Colonel Philip Corso is simply telling the truth. The problem is there are going to be a lot of people that simply can't handle the truth, and they're going to be using a variety of psychological mechanisms, including suppression, denial, rationalization, to avoid dealing with this simple truth. Uh, and the truth is that, uh, Colonel, you had all of this material given to you by General Trudeau, which you then um, apparently funded. Uh, in other words, you actually began to go to American industry and give them this material along with budgets to develop this technology. And what you're telling us is that the technology we enjoy today, much of it, fiber optics, uh, night vision goggles, and on and on and on, all came from an alien uh, crash or alien crashes. Do you know totally uh, how many there were, Colonel? No, I really don't have the count. Uh, I had about a dozen important items. Uh, so I, I don't know, really, at the moment I'd have to go through my notes uh, that I, the book was taken from and see how many we did have. Do you know, Colonel, whether you were the only one given these alien uh, artifacts or whether others were uh, doing parallel work? I heard rumors that the Air Force was doing parallel work. 
Uh -huh. But we never cross fertilized because we kept it ourselves to protect our, let's say, our organization. Uh, you also believe, do you not, that the Germans uh, were doing some parallel? They were doing it. Their scientists actually told me this, and people of the caliber of von Braun and Albert. All right. Uh, you've mentioned the names of several people, Colonel, who were involved over the years. Frank Kaufman, uh, one of the still-living first-hand witnesses. Uh, yeah, I, I met him at Roswell. I had him as a guest uh, on this program a couple of weeks ago and claimed to have been part of the cleanup team at Roswell. Can you confirm that Frank Kaufman was involved in the cleanup? Yes, I met him out there. I think he was a sergeant then. And he was very happy that I finally came forward. Uh, we had dinner one night at the Roswell Inn there, in Roswell. So I was introduced to him. It was the first time I met the man. And it seemed, uh, he's almost, uh, he's my age, I think. And he was very logical and very emphatic of what he saw. All right, well, one of the things he did, uh, Colonel, was dispute your claim that a creature was shot at the crash site. No, I I'm not sure of that, whether it was shot or not. Uh, th that possibly, that I'm not certain of. So that could be... I think Kaufman is right on that. All right. I think I was sort of an error in there. I shouldn't have been in. All right, since you've written your book... Uh, this is a very, very important book. Uh, if you believe it, it changes all of our history, or a great portion of our history, and what we think of ourselves. Uh, has anybody senior in government come to you since the publication of this book and told you to shut your mouth? No. No one. Why do you think that? Why well, do you think that? When Mitchell, the astronaut, confirmed it, he confirmed that I was a sort of a maverick. And... Uh, I don't take uh, things that are trying to, to stop me from talking lightly if anybody would try it. Nobody's ever tried it. And again, uh, the things that you're able to talk about, uh, you're able to talk about because they really weren't classified in the normal way. Well, you, our, you can see that the chip, for example, or the integrated circuit. Yes. It's now known worldwide. Yes. There's no classification. Uh, the super tenacity fibers. They're known worldwide now. There's no classification anymore. Mm -hmm. Fiber optics has developed tremendously since our day. Our communication, there's no classification anymore. The imaging devices, we made the first heart pump. The first heart pump? We made that. The Army did. And that came from this technology oh, as yes. well? For the hydrodynamics. We had a car at Harry Diamond Laboratory, a little cart that ran on water. Same as in the greatest circuits, the electricity we put water through and it ran. And I told Senator Glenn about this, and he wanted a photograph that I had. I gave it to him, and I told him, call Harry Diamond Lab. They still might have it up there. It's the north of Delphia, north of Washington, D.C. Do you retain a photograph of this? Yeah, I have one. You have I, one? I gave it to Senator Glenn, the one I had, but I have another one. And what did Senator Glenn do with it? I don't know. I never. I haven't talked to him since I gave it to him. Well, uh, Dr. Alexander, I can only imagine now with the book having been out for a while, with the claims the colonel is making, uh, after all, we're talking about some very serious technologies here, that there would be people coming forward and saying, this colonel is out of his mind, uh, we developed so-and-so in our lab, and we didn't get any special materials in order to do that, and I've heard none of that. Have you, John? Oh, you hear some, uh, <clears throat> certainly. And you've got to remember, the way they did it, um, it makes it untraceable. Uh, by design. So, I mean, if you remember, what Phil said was that they, uh, if you believe the story, that they were handing it to people already working in the field, getting material that in some cases they thought was Soviet, uh, but that the technology was beginning to move already. Um, Bell Laboratory confirmed that. They thought we got it from the Russians. Well, at that time, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just saying what I believe, uh, our technological advances were far ahead of the Soviets, were they not? Yes, in, in, in areas, most areas. areas. Some they weren't. Yeah, th that, was, that was not across the board. I mean, there, there were areas that the Soviets had done some work that exceeded our capabilities. In fact, uh, our, uh, we were really, one day, I went to the general, the... See, I was the first project officer on anti-missile missile. 
and I recommended the colonel, a friend of mine. He came to me one day and he said, I feel like I got something very serious. The Soviets can take their ICBMs and train, change trajectory in the air. That was a very serious thing. That left us almost without any defenses. In other words, in other words, it is not a ballistic missile in the sense that you fire it and it has a specific trajectory and it goes up and comes right back down. Uh, no, it was an anti ICBM. So they continental. And they they acquired this ability before we did. Yes, the capability of changing trajectory in space. In fact, uh, we went to General Trudeau and he got alarmed too because that was a very serious thing. And we went to work on, and we developed a countermeasure within a short time. It, got, it had a crash program. All right, so now, like that happened. now that you have come forward, Colonel, with this incredible information, uh, surely there are others, other than General Trudeau, who has now passed on, who could confirm what now, you're saying. Lately, I had four officers come up to me in uniform. In uniform. Uh, officers and they confirmed two colonels confirmed to me that this was true they knew about it and a lieutenant colonel came and the test pilot from B2 came up to me in uniform in uniform yeah I don't want to say where it was because I don't want anybody looking into it and they verified this to me just two uh, ten days ago they're not prepared to come forward though no, and I did get a, a letter from and I don't think he's if I tell, tell his name, he's McDonald's son, a scientist. And he confirmed to me in a letter he wrote to me before I left home when he sent me a radio letter. He talked to people. He was on the Jason Committee. And he said that Hughes aircraft, Hughes, North American, mm -hmm. and Wright Pat, people who were confirmed, that finally they said, we filled in some of the holes that we, were, we wondered about all our lives. Uh, John it just came to me in a letter a few days ago. John Alexander, right. Dr. Alexander, um, uh, with what resources you've had, uh, what aspects of this have you been able to confirm? Well, what I can confirm is, uh, revolves around uh, Phil's background. All right. That, as we mentioned earlier, he had come forward twice. We actually only mentioned one of the incidents, one, you know, kind of the, the secret war that was going on. The other was a POW exploitation program that the uh, KGB had run for uh, 50 years. Uh, and that came out last year. And so he has twice told very unusual tales and turned out to be true. Uh, when uh, I have talked to folks who, as I said, knew him, um, they state they cannot confirm uh, the details of this, but state we should not disregard him. Mm -hmm. um, Colonel, can you confirm that reverse engineering uh, was going on at either Area 51 or Area S4, uh, those areas out here in our Nevada desert that you are now very close to? Now, from information I had, yes, it was going on. But I don't have the details. I never bothered to try to get them because I figured that was a sister service. They, they, they're military. In fact, General Trudeau went up in front of Congress, and he was testifying, and he recommended and stunned everybody that instead of turn it over to NASA to turn everything in space over to the Air Force. And people were stunned when he said that. And he actually said this in front of the Senate committee. So um, we didn't bother with them. They were doing their own work. We trusted them, and we let them alone. And we figured it's best that we stay where we are to ourselves. All right. To this day, how compartmentalized do you believe it is? For example, do you think the president and our current National Security Council are now in the loop or is all of this still off to the side and a government in effect within a government that uh, that harbors this information? Well, the government, you know, when you talk about the government, Art, it's a huge organization. Of course. And I've said in some of my interviews, leave the government alone, it'll cover itself up. <laughs> 
you know, and that's true. That's what happened. That happened on my uh, POW reports, missing POWs I sent from Japan. Kissinger even and Skokov said that didn't, those reports didn't exist, yet they were there. We found them later. They just, people didn't want to do anything with them. When you touch UFOs, people run and hide for some reason. I know. And I guess it's still going on. Because I've been attacked, minor attacks, so nothing of any consequence. And uh, even uh, uh, Whitney Sabert, you know, the man who wrote communion? Yes. He told me, he said, Phil, he said, some of the, at Roswell, he said, that, he said, Phil, some of the attacks are we treading on their territory. Oh, that's right. That's how, that's how you know you begin to get attacked. Uh, do you yeah. believe, Colonel, that foreign technology, the foreign technology division, uh, may still be involved? in seeding this technology uh, into industry because uh, we didn't figure it all out uh, back then. I really d I can't say. I, I'm not clear anymore, and I haven't been in contact for a while. All the people tell me, like these uni people in uniform just told me, a week ago is still going on. So I hope it is because it's important enough to keep on going. And I think some of these developments... I surprised my son one day because we built airplanes, these Rutan type airplanes, and uh, a B-2 came over an air show, and I told him what to do, and he, he called me. He said, "Oh no, it can't." Uh, then I ca he, he called me up, and he said, "It came over and it flew like a, a little airplane. It held near impossible for a big airplane like that." <laughs> that means some of the developments are going into that craft. It has to be. Say, Art. Yes, John. Uh, on uh, FTD, and and again, this was an army small army organization, not the one at uh, Wright-Patterson or the Air Force. Um, one of the things I was able to confirm is that uh, when uh, Phil came to the Pentagon, this unit was created, and right after he left, it disappears. If you follow, what I did is go through the phone books uh, for that period in the Pentagon. So you were able to confirm that division uh, at that time? At that time, and then it disappears as he retires. And, and right after Trudeau left, because remember, he was working directly for Trudeau. And uh, right after, a few months after General Trudeau retired, that's when uh, Phil Corso retired. Yeah, I, I retired six months after he did. Six months. General Beach, who was, he gave me my last decoration, the Army Commendation Medal, for what I did with General Trudeau. Uh, General Trudeau. But I still stayed in touch with General Trudeau. And three years ago he died, releasing you from your vows to him. Yes. And, and he, then what made you decide, Colonel, to write this book? I mean, you... Well, one of the reasons I decided to write it, my grandchildren, the three little boys, asked me one day, what did, what, did I do, what did you do during the war, Granddad? Hmm. So I figured I'd better leave him a legacy and put it on paper, because really, I, I never had any intention of writing a book, you know. That wasn't my area at all. And I started to write. And I put it all down, including my Italian uh, uh, experiences and even other investigations that I did in the government. I started to put those on paper. I, I figured at least I'll leave them for the little boy, a legacy for the little boys. And so it evolved into this book, which I never expected to see that. Colonel, if you had not written this book, you're 82, you're not going to be around forever. None of us will. Uh, would we eventually, in your view, know about all of this? Would there be anybody to come forward, or would eventually all those who can tell the story you're now telling? Well, I think that most of them are gone, really, now. Remember, most of the people that, that were working with me were my age. They all had been honed in combat, and that's how we were able to keep a secret. There was a certain affinity between us. And I think that they're mostly all gone because... A good percentage of them are older than I was. In fact, in the testimony, uh, when I testified in front of Congress on missing prisons, where I told the, because the families were sitting there, I said that uh, the, when I met the boys, that Pamela and John coming across, they were younger than me, maybe, and I'm 82 and I'm still here, maybe some of them are still alive. Of course, it was a long shot, but at least it was some hope for the families. Sure. Um... At one time, Barry Goldwater asked General LeMay about seeing the secret room, some secret room at Wright Pat Air Force Base. Yeah. Uh, LeMay told Gold Goldwater, uh, actually cussed at him and said, never ask me about it again. Yeah, that's right. Was Goldwater unknowingly referring to your room? No, he was referring to Wright Patterson. Wright Patterson, where those bodies went and where you yeah. presume... Uh, I knew Goldwater. I used to go up his office and talk to him. 
Uh-huh. In fact, I notified him when his private line had been tapped by CIA. Did he ever ask you about this? No, technology? he never did. He didn't know I was involved. And I never I never told him. The only one that knew really on Capitol Hill was Thurman knew. And the Senator, Bridge, uh, Senator uh, Eastland knew. But those were the only two. And McCormick knew. I forgot about McCormick. I was great friends with John McCormick, the Speaker of the House. He knew also. He knew. Because I went up to MIT with him and gave a lecture, and uh, and uh, the speaker was a uh, grand old man, and he was a good friend of mine. We got along real fine. So he knew. I told him about it. Uh, one wonders, uh, and it is reasonable to ask, Colonel, why you are the only one who has come forward this publicly with this information. It's incredible. I don't know. Maybe I'm. Maybe I, I don't know any better. I don't know. I can't answer that, Art. <laughs> All right, Colonel, hold on. Uh, we'll be back to you in a moment. Uh, Dr. John Alexander and Colonel Philip J. Corso are my guests. Sit back. Listen, you're hearing history. This is Premier Networks. That was Art Bell hosting Coast to Coast AM on this Somewhere in Time. to Art Bell, Somewhere in Time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 4th of July, 2001. Back down to my guests. Uh, Colonel Corso, what you have said, what you're saying in your book and here on the air, is so incredible, so fantastic, that you would have to imagine that there would be elements within the government and out of it that are aware of your information, and there must be some kind of battle going on between the people who know uh, about whether it should become public or not. I mean, this, this affects all, all of our recent history, Colonel. Um, is there a battle going on? Will there be others? Are you the last? What do you think? No, I've had calls from some of them. Uh, they'll come forward in time, but I can't expose their names without their permission. Now, also another thing, Art, I really don't think that this is going to cause any panic or anything. Because I think from what I saw at Roswell, when the, the families brought their children up to meet me, they're accepting this. They wanted to know. And they're accepting it, and they're going to go right along with it and live with it. I don't think there's going to be any great explosion or any panic. I think they're accepting it as a thing of the future, and I, I think it'll, it'll end up that way. And that's the way I hope it ends up. This is part of history. It's written now. The young ones accept it, and mostly... I want the young ones to accept it because we won't be here that long, but they will still be around. And I think that's what's going to happen to the book. It's going to be accepted. It's what they wanted to hear. Hey, Art. Yes, Jim. Can I interject a, a kind of an administrative thing? You haven't had a chance to talk. Um, I might mention, you know, I talked, said that Phil is high energy, and I think we can see that, but he's now in 17 hours today. I understand. So, <laughs> um, but it might structure the kinds of questions you want to answer in, in this uh, segment. All right, Colonel, I asked you this on Dreamland, but I think it has to be asked again. Uh, on Dateline, I think it was Dateline, uh, at the very end of the interview, you said something that people used to discredit your story. You said uh, you would tell them sometime about a time machine or something about a time machine. Yeah. Can you clear that up? Well, I discussed that with Herman Obert, the German. I think it's in the book. And that in time, I think, will be clarified. Because there's other countries that are working on things of that type. But at the moment, I think I'll just leave it the way it is the book, that those were discussions with Herman Obert at the time. All right. Uh, if you had items from a crashed UFO in your office, uh, did you at any time consider the possibility that there was potential danger, radiation, whatever else, uh, on handling these materials? Well, we considered that on the chip uh, and the integrated circuit, like I told you that we might be leasing something on the world which we didn't understand. You see, Art, I'm not, I'm, I tell a lot of people, don't think that we were so intelligent that we knew what we were doing all the time. We didn't know what these things would do and how they would end up. Even fiber optics, we never knew how that would work. We didn't even know if it was wires at the time. Yes, sir. But gradually it, it, it evolved and developed. All right, if our military, since 1947, 
has had the only physical evidence, or at least some physical evidence, of the existence of alien ET spacecraft, um, which would be considered certainly a reasonable threat to national security. Why has the military shown no interest in civilian UFO reports? Well, you, you, there's another thing, Art, where you'd have to split the military up. Which part of the military doesn't want to see it, and which part does want to see it? That's a good point. Because we were the opinion, we were military, we wanted it out, and we gave it out. Some of the Air Force people are the same way. Other factions in there don't want to put it out because they're afraid of being labeled kooks and so forth. But I think that gradually some of the new developments I've seen, I think, refer back. Now, that wing, that B-2 flies, there must be something on anti-gravity in there that I know about. But I'm not sure of that because I haven't seen it myself, see. And I never bothered. If it's classified, I'm not clear of any longer. I can't go and find out about it. But sometimes I hear from friends of mine, you know. When you were given this file cabinet, how long did it take for you to realize what you had on your hands? Oh, I'd say that I gave General Trudeau the entire plan within a couple of months that to start to develop and how we should start to develop them. And then gradually, as I looked at the things and conferred with, uh, with scientists and other people, I began to see which courses to take. And I'd recommend those to the general, and then the decision would be made. Of course, the general made all these final decisions. See, I didn't. Uh, Dr. Alexander, I've asked many questions, uh, and if there are any critical questions that you would like, like to ask the colonel, you should. Well, of course, I've had uh, quite a bit of time to do that. Um, yes, you have. Before we checked him out, I, I guess a couple of things I would say, you know, one of the questions that comes up is, uh, is this guy crazy? And uh, we frankly, um, I don't know if he knows this, but had somebody qualified to do that, interact with him, and came back and said, you know, we may not agree with him, but he's not crazy. Sometimes I question that myself, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I look back at these things, I have to question that. Uh, what is it like for you now, uh, Colonel? Are you getting a lot of criticism? Uh, no, no, very little criticism. Very little. In fact, already some of my uh, debunkers and skeptics have come up to shake hands with me. So uh, there is very little criticism. In fact... Uh, I'll tell you, I had some misgivings on how I received out there. People meet me in restaurants at the airport. Right. Because I've never lived this type of life. I've always been sort of in the shadows, you know. Sure. And I had misgivings. In fact, I made the statement out there a few times, and uh, Michael Letterman caught this when I told him. I told him, you know, when I see all this, I figure, what am I doing here? I should be holding my easy chair. <laughs> because, really, I told Simon and Schuster when they wanted me to go on tour, I told him, I have to tell you the truth, gentlemen, I have some misgivings about this. I've never, never been in this arena before. Mm -hmm. See? But now I'm thrown in it, and I guess I've got to make the best of it. Um, to your knowledge, since those early crashes and retrievals and the technology and the bodies and all the rest of it, in the years between then and now, do you have any knowledge of additional crashes? Yes, I had knowledge of that. Oh? The Germans confirmed it. Wilbur Smith, the great Canadian genius, confirmed it to me in person, right in the Pentagon. He came to visit us. I had a good session with him. Then the general came back from his meeting, and he, he told Wilbur Smith, he said, you and the colonel have a lot to talk about. I'm going to send him up to your laboratory. I was supposed to go up to Mayboro, his laboratory in Lake Ontario area. Of course, I put it off, put it off. Then when they did call the up there, they told me Wilbur Smith in 1962, when I was going up, he had died of cancer. So that was a great loss. Then the general got a hold, and I told the general that. He said, sit right down at the table, and you write down everything that you discuss with Mr. Smith, because he's gone now. Well, Colonel, you're getting up in age, 82. Uh, there are no doubt contemporaries of yours out there, probably around the same age. A lot of them may be listening to you right now. What do you want them to do? Well, at the right time, let them come out because this information should be told to the younger people. 
and I'd like to see him come out and do like I did. Tell the young people this. They're the ones who are going to be around. We won't be around here. But let them know what you know. And I think, and I know some of these men, if they're still alive, I think they will do it. They were, they were tough men. They were good men. Um, your information is so very serious that I would imagine uh, a congressional committee or a Senate uh, hearing would like to sit you down and make this public. If uh, you were summoned to Washington to tell this story, to get it out uh, in, in a public forum, would you go? I've appeared in front of six congressional committees. Public? And I have nothing to hide if they're serious in what they want to do. Public, Colonel? Public? That, yeah, they were public. No, one wasn't. The one that I, I that in 1962 was still classified top secret. That's the one I discussed with Attorney General Robert Kennedy. And no, that's still secret. But the others are unclassified. You see, congressional committees a lot of times are not serious about what they're doing. It's done for publicity. And I know I was on Capitol Hill. If it's publicity, I won't do it. If it's to inform the people, yes, I'll be glad to go in front of a congressional committee. Uh, Dr. Alexander, do you think there's any likelihood that in light of this information becoming so public, such a hearing might be held? Um, I would not be terribly hopeful, frankly, and, and I've been checking some sources. Uh, I know a number of people on the Hill and, and uh, staffers and people who work it. Um, face it, the political downside for a politician to get actively involved is uh, uh, much higher than the benefits to be gained uh, as long as the media reports these things the way they do. Well, that might be true, certainly, of UFO reports or people asking questions about lights over Phoenix or all the rest of it. But when you've got somebody the stature of Colonel Corso uh, with what he has said and where we confirm he has been... Uh, saying the things he's saying, it seems to me it demands an investigation and that uh, any senator or congressman uh, could not be too heavily criticized for wanting to hear from Colonel Corso. Well, here's the thing, Art, I can explain. My last testimony was in front of Congressman Dornan's committee on the missing prisoners of war. Right. They had a Czech general there. And the Czech general had been, his life had been threatened three times because he said this experiment's come. And so Dornan asked me if I would appear and run interference for the general, appear before him and sit alongside of him, because I would add credibility to the general they were trying to smear, because he was Czechoslovakian. Yes. And the man told a true story. And I confirmed what he said. It was true, because I knew about those hospitals. I knew about those experiments. Now, it took a man like Dornan, who had the nerve to get up there and hold a committee. And the families were there that day, too. They were waiting for me outside in the hallway when I came. Yeah, there's one thing Dornan has. It's, it's that kind of tenacity. Yeah. And so it needs that kind of tenacity. And somebody that will take it in, in spite of criticism. Because it's very simple. A newspaper reporter will say, well, this congressman is getting into a kooky subject. All right, some people may be in his area where he gets votes will believe that. So why should they take the chance? I wish they would. But I, I doubt it. I know enough on that. Uh, remember, Art, there's a huge political downside. Uh, while uh, Phil says he has not had a lot of overt criticism, uh, that's because the book, I think, is fairly new and, and people are not, not directly threatened. If you elevate this to congressional hearings, you're now a direct threat. <laughs> you know, well, that's, what I, that's what I was hoping for, John, uh, some sort of direct threat to um, a lie by omission. I mean, it's about time. If what the colonel says is true, uh, then he's our best connection uh, to what really has occurred. Here's an interesting question for you, Colonel. If all of the technology that was gleaned from Roswell and any other crashes that have occurred, alien technology, had not been interwoven with American industry, where would we be today? Well, I'll give you a little example. I had a file 
in one of my files, it was in the second drawer, which was called Project Rainbow. Yes, sir. This was Von Neumann's. You remember uh, Von, John Von Neumann? Yes. It was his project on artificial light. Now, I went through that file two or three times and I always put it away when I could have started an operation on that. Artificial, when you say artificial life, what do you mean? By computer. They're starting to work on that now. You're talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, that's right. You bet they're working it's on it. artificial intelligence. It's the wrong word I gave you. Now, Von Neumann, I didn't start that project. And a lot of people told me, well, it wasn't time because there were no supercomputers in. Now they can work on that, and they're working on it, artificial intelligence, because a supercomputer is available now, which wasn't available back then. So I think this is some of the developments that are coming up out of this, that new things can be taken, can be new developments may be taken from that craft. Maybe they can work in now what I said, that the being himself was part of the propulsion system, part of the UFO himself. Well, it, that also is interesting because, uh, Dr. Alexander, I'm sure you can confirm, we are beginning to work very seriously now on integration of pilots with our aircraft. Um, they tell us, uh, or I'm told, that there may come a time soon when a pilot will simply think commands for the aircraft. Is that ongoing research? Well, Firefox is certainly ongoing. I, I think, however, the next step is to take the pilot out of the aircraft. And uh, have it be completely robotic. Uh, correct. What they're calling uh, well, unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned, uh, un unoccupied uh, combat uh, vehicles. Well, that's really what the superintelligence did. They took what they were or their people out and put a, a robot or a humanoid in there. Sounds more like a humanoid. Um, in other words, half, half machine, half biological uh, entity. One day I, I was walking down the hall with General Trudeau, and I told him, General, I think that son of mine is a little bit crazy. He says the engines talk to him. <laughs> the general stopped. He said, don't say that, Phil, because the people, some people have certain relationships with engine and solid matter, which we don't understand yet. Now, this was actually General Trudeau's words to me when I approached him on that subject. So a racing driver, at times he says he's, he feels like he's part of the, of the racer, of the, engine, of the car he's driving. Right. You see, these things we don't know too well yet. We haven't lived. Li and I think that in the book where I say that the UFO was an electromagnetic thing and the, the, the EB, or the extraterrestrial, was part of that aircraft, of that UFO. An integral part of it. He was a propulsion system, an integral part of it. This is what we're talking about now. Do you think those bodies are still at Wright-Patterson? No, because the lab said that they faded very fast. Their composition, I think we didn't study it enough, really. We should have. And that was partially I blame myself for, because I could have carried that on, and I didn't do it. In other words, the, um, the disposition of the bodies... That was in your hands, Colonel? Well, I could have, at the time... You could have followed up. I could have followed it up and done something and made them study more with what they had before the things all deteriorated to the point where we couldn't work on them anymore or look at them. The Air Force recently, of course, uh, at the 50th anniversary of Roswell, or just prior to it, had a big news conference, and they disclaimed the whole thing uh, once again. Uh, how did you react when you saw that, Colonel? Well... Sadness. I can't con conceive what what they're what they're thinking. I can't conceive why they're doing that. It's beyond me. And it's like I told most of the newsmen, I wouldn't criticize the sister service. I follow them in Korea. A lot of them, I have a lot of friends in the Air Force, and I won't criticize them. And I tell them, please, gentlemen, don't ask me to criticize. But their superiors, I can't even conceive or why they did something like this. And I made the statement, if I had done something like that, I think General Trudeau would have thrown me out of the top window of the Pentagon. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I, I can't understand that, uh, uh, Art. We are uh, at the top of the hour. I have more time. If you can stay fine, if you feel like you've got to get to bed, fine. It's up to you. I, I think we ought to. Uh, Phil has a plane in the morning. Oh. Well, then, Colonel Corso, I want to thank you for being here. As I told you when you were on Dreamland, you're a very patriotic person. And... Um, 
you've given us a lot to think about. Colonel, thank you. John Alexander, doctor, thank you. Art, you might uh, want to hear this. This concerns you. Or, oh, it me? Okay. I went in the bookstore, and there was 300 people there. And uh, they set up a microphone. I had to talk to them. And at least a dozen women came out to me and said they'd heard your show. Hmm. And they said, and Art, well, he sounded happy, real happy and pleased. I thought, well, I'm going to let him know that. And then uh, an elder woman came up to me. She was on, not in the line. And she had heard your show. And she said she was in her sick bed. And got up out of her sick bed to come over and shake hands with me. And when she told me she got out of her sick bed, she was leaning over and I was sitting down. And I reached up and hugged her. And she uh, kissed me in the cheek and started to cry. So I figured it was all worthwhile right there. Colonel, I understand. And she heard your show, too. And they praised you, Art, so I, I, I want you to know that. Colonel, I... opened at Albuquerque at the bookstore. Well, thank you. Uh, where do you go from here? I'm going home tomorrow. Going home, Sit fine. in my easy chair for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an incredible thing that you have done, sir, uh, for us, for our country, um, for the history books. And I personally want to thank you. Well, uh, thanks, for, and I think you're, you know, we're all part of it, so are you, Art. And I hope it works out, and I hope we keep making improvements in the state of great country. And some of the things we did there I haven't told you about that should be done that they stopped us from doing. And sometime we'll talk about those, too. All right, Colonel. Yeah. Well, thank you, Art. Thank you so much, and Dr. Alexander, thank you. Okay, good night. Good thank night. You. Good night, gentlemen.